This sitting is resumed. Order number eight, sir. In the name of the Honorable Minister of Labor, Social Partnership, Relations, and the Third Sector, to move the second reading of the Employment Prevention of Discrimination Bill, 2020. Honorable Member for St. Peter. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today, like every other day that this government has been in office and has come to this honorable chamber, is a day when serious business is transacted. I have to confess that I am cognizant of that, but I'm also still coming to grips with the loss that St. Peter has suffered and uh, that wider Barbados and the region. And I think I'm on good ground in saying the world has lost. And the passing of former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Owen Arthur, has been a significant blow to all of us. It has impacted me because I have always considered that I have come to this place standing on his shoulders. And I, I said to him, I did not have, I would not have had to step high, literally, to step on his shoulders, but figuratively, Mr. Speaker, intellectually, a giant of a man, and I stand in many, many ways in his shadow. He had a number of sayings, and one of them, when he meant that you had to go and do what you were supposed to do, one of them started with face it. And so, in tribute to him, to some degree, I am facing what I have to do in spite of what is going on in my mind and in my heart today. I'd like to express to the Honorable Chamber the Thanks to, on behalf of the people of St. Peter, for the opportunity that he was given and that we gave to him to participate in this chamber, in the business of the chamber, and ultimately to be part of the leadership of the chamber and of the country. And so we move forward cognizant of the road that he has traveled and cognizant of the path that he has left for us, me in particular, as his successor in representing the constituency, the path that he has, with his larger than life feet, left for us to traverse. And in many ways, Mr. Speaker, he was a groundbreaker. In many ways, he was a groundbreaker. He was a visionary. And I've found that he is in the tradition of Barbados Labour Party visionaries. So we go back to the late right excellent Sir Grantly Herbert, and we often speak of Tom Adams. We speak of Owen Arthur as a visionary where he wanted to take Barbados. And now we have the honorable member for St. Michael Northeast in that tradition of vision, in that tradition of excellence, in that tradition of representing Barbados not as a backwater place somewhere behind somebody's back, but a country that is able to stand toe to toe with any other country in this world. And that is the, the basis. He, he was a cricketing man, so that is the wicket 
I'm not a cricketing person, but I, at least I know some of the words. That is the wicket on which I will try my hand. That is the wicket he has left for me. It is the wicket he has left for us. To bat or, to, or, or remember to bat or to bowl or to do both? Um, to, 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 to bat. I, I can hold the bat. I'm not sure if the ball will connect to the bat. But at least I, I've learned from the honorable member for St. Michael Northeast. If I cover the stumps and I leave balls outside the off stump, then I should be good. I should be good. I should last a little while. True. So in following on my predecessor in St. Peter, and following the instruction of the Honorable Prime Minister, the Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast, I am going to block the stumps and let any balls outside the off stump travel and go past. If the umpire wants to call wide, the umpire is so able to do. But as I speak, Mr. Speaker, yeah, that would be more appropriate. But Mr. Arthur, the, the, the former Honorable Prime Minister, was not into basketball. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> the Barbados Labour Party was born out of an uprising by the people of this country against discrimination. Two days ago, we celebrated the Day of National Significance, July 26. And on July 26, every year, we reflect on those days, that period of time, in 1937, when the people said to the country, we have had enough of being discriminated against. We have had enough of being put at the back of the line, made to sit in the back of the church, made to struggle even to get an elementary education, being forced to struggle to earn a living so that they could survive. The people rose up two days ago, 1937, to say we have had enough of that. The Moyne Commission was established, it did its work, and it agreed that the people were being discriminated against. In St. Peter, particularly in Boscobel, there are these stories about the shaking of the canes so that rats would run out so that people could catch them in bags. This is not in 37, this would have been a, a couple decades before. But the suffering of a people, people being deprived of the ability not just to earn, but having earned, if they could have, they would have been able to eat. The people of this country rose up against that kind of a society. And discrimination occurs. There are some who believe that they are better than others. We spoke to this quite extensively when we debated the resolution brought by the Honorable Member for Christchurch South on Black Lives Matter. But there are situations where people feel better than others. And because they feel they are better than others, then they have the right to treat other people as lesser. So that others do not have to, or are not allowed to, enjoy the same benefits that they enjoy. Because they are superior whether it is something as serious and as fundamental as the color of skin, whether it is something as fundamental as ethnicity, whether it is something as fundamental as a person's sex, but it also extends and it has so extended for thousands of years 
there have been cases where, many cases, where women who either could not bear children or who chose not to bear children were seen as lesser than those who bore children. And Mr. Speaker, even in my lifetime, I've had what I think people consider to be jokes, but I've had situations where people have intimated to me that because I have two daughters, no sons, that I may be a little bit less than them. No, that is not fundamental, but it speaks to a mindset, a psychological construct, where because of some advantage I'm perceived to have, I am better than you because you do not exhibit the same thing. You do not possess the same thing. And so I am better than you, so I can treat you differently. I can treat you and I can stop you from being able to access, from being able to achieve, from being able to live. And that, Mr. Speaker, is not acceptable. And then there is also the case where some people discriminate against others because they do not hold the same view. They don't hold the same view. And disagreeing is one thing. But when that disagreement speaks to, when it gets to the point of right and wrong, which I don't have an issue with, because, Mr. Speaker, I did not come to politics to speak things that are politically correct. The Member of Parliament for St. Peter, the last one and the current one, believe that some things are right and some things are wrong. Now, that may be judgmental. But I want to say to you, Mr. Speaker, that that does not give me permission to discriminate against those who I believe are wrong. So if I felt it were wrong, and I'm going to use this example because I know that you are a man who understands mirth. If I felt it were wrong for a man to grow here longer than one inch, it would not give me the right to, to discriminate against the current speaker of this honorable house of assembly. It does not, because as far as I am concerned, we are equal. We are all human beings. But there are some cases where because of differences of views, some people are perceived to be lesser. Some people are believed to be so far outside of what is considered correct that they are to be mistreated. And I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, that a country cannot exist with that kind of a construction on its society. Discrimination in any form is for me an unacceptable scourge. It is a scourge. Anytime one human being treats another human being as lesser, that is a scourge on humanity. And as far as I am concerned, it must be rooted out. Discrimination in all of its forms is wrong. And discrimination in all of its forms must be rooted out of our society. I want to, to, to say, Mr. Speaker, that 400 years of racial discrimination, 400 years of the chattel slavery, or the, in, the, 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 what is called chattel slavery, the enslavement of African people, and the attempt to dehumanize them must have said something to us. The attempt to reduce human beings to chattel, to property that could be bought and sold and beaten and cut up and heads taken off, because we had some of that in St. Peter as well. In 16, I think around 1675, somewhere in that area, after the 
fear rebellion by coffee. Those who were found to be part of that rebellion, their heads were cut off by the planters of the day and put on sticks along Orange Street and Sand Street in Spike Sound. That attempt to dehumanize Africans and people of African descent should be saying something to us as a people and to Barbados as a country. Over a thousand, maybe 1,500 years of religious wars across countries, across continents, over 1,500 years of that approach to sharing right and wrong, or perceptions of right and wrong, should say something to us as their people, should say something to us as part of their world. The discrimination that has resulted in the atrocities that we have seen meted out, so that in the early 1900s, Aryan supremacy, th that belief that one group is better than another, and because the other group is not as good, they can be exterminated. These kinds of things should speak to us as a parliament, should speak to us as a country, should speak to us as a people whose minds have come to grips with the realities of history and who have made decisions that they will not allow the, error, the errors of history to be repeated. And so we have a responsibility, Mr. Speaker, in our time, in this time, we have a responsibility not to make the errors of the past. And when I come to this honorable chamber, like I did in my election campaign, when I say that I stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before, including the late Right Honorable Owen S. Arthur, when I say stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before, I refer to the fact that I intend to build on the experiences of those who have gone before me. I speak about my understanding that I will build on their strengths and that I will avoid their errors. That I will examine what has happened before me, what has transpired. And out of that examination, we can move forward because we are not making the, the mistakes, the errors of the past. Mr. Speaker, given this party's long-standing support for justice, given the role of our founder, the no right excellent Sir Grantley Herbert Adams, in first representing Clement Payne, but secondly, after Clement Payne's deportation, taking on the role of what the masses coined as Moses, representing scriptural Moses who led the children of Israel into the promised land. Given the role of our founders, we recognize as a party that we have, as part of our DNA, a commitment to social justice, to justice generally. And so that is why, as a government, in different eras, we have spoken to economic enfranchisement, we have spoken to economic democracy, and in our covenant of hope and in our manifesto of more recent times, we have spoken to and specifically coined, or well, used the term, social justice. Because we recognize that economic democracy has very little meaning if there is not social 
justice. So money in my pocket, if there are certain places I can't go, renders the money a little bit meaningless. Social justice must go with economic enfranchisement and the democratization of the economic structures of the country. And Mr. Speaker, this idea of social justice is not one that we conjured up. This idea of social justice and the need to move our country toward a place where all of us can feel that we have, that there's justice meted out, that there's an equality. Getting to that point, to include it in the Covenant of Hope and subsequently in the Manifesto, was a result of our speaking with our people. And as we moved around the country, as we engage with ordinary people, as we rub shoulders, as we had conducted people's assemblies where people spoke freely, as we interacted with Barbadians, we recognized that there was a call, a pull, a push, a strong desire to see social justice. And in your profession, Mr. Speaker, you've come across both in, in your social work profession, and not your legal profession, many people who feel disconnected from what is called sometimes the system because they do not feel that they are fully embraced by this construct that they see us walking around in suits talking about. They do not always feel that sense of social justice, justice of the person, justice for every person, a justice that speaks to the fact that all of us are human beings in this together. So that after having spoken with our people, after listening to them, we've said in our documents, every Bajan matters. Every Bajan matters. We've also said, Mr. Speaker, that we have a commitment to build a just, stable, and sustainable society. A just, stable, and sustainable society. And Mr. Speaker, I want us to reflect on that statement for just a moment, because I do not intend to be too long. Like I said, we have spoken in this honorable house this honorable chamber at length about discrimination before. But I want us to reflect on the progression in that statement. A society will not be sustainable, cannot be sustainable, if it is not stable. Anything that is unstable is likely to, as we were saying in St. Peter, bust loose at some point in time. Sustainability can only happen if there is stability. And then, Mr. Speaker, a country, a society, can only be stable if there is justice. And so our party and government, our structuring of this phrase speaks to a recognition that justice comes first. Justice is the bedrock for stability, the further bedrock for sustainability. Our role in government, Mr. Speaker, in, at this time in the country's history is to make sure that the foundation of justice is laid that the foundation of justice is well laid so that the constructs of stability and sustainability can sit on that firm foundation. In our manifesto, Mr. Speaker, 
we also spoke to the idea of people-centered development in recognition that justice and stability and sustainability will all just be fancy words. All be fancy words, many of them will be meaningless words if our development is not at its core people-centered. So that people are those who we are looking after. That is the reason why at the level of the social partnership, Mr. Speaker, we've said safe people doing safe work or engaging in safe activities in a safe country, recognizing that people come first. Our first responsibility is the people. I know the Honorable Member for St. Michael's South Central will want me to say that dogs come a close second. But people come first in our developmental model. People come first in our approach to creating that sustainable society which is built on stability, which is built on justice for people. One of the fundamental components of justice in any country, in any society, is the ability to earn a living and provide for oneself. That is fundamental. A person who cannot acquire food cannot live very long. A person who cannot acquire food cannot live for very long. And so, Mr. Speaker, the ability to acquire that food becomes important. And as I speak to that, I remember again, and you will, I know, forgive me in the circumstances, remember my predecessor who spoke in 1994 to the creation of 30,000 jobs. Who spoke to the idea of creating or getting as close as possible to what economists would call full employment? Maybe two or three percent unemployment. In some cases, four. Considered full employment because of transitions and that kind of thing. But that is in the DNA of this party. The understanding that for people to survive, then they must have employment. They must be able to earn a living so that they can buy food to feed themselves and to keep themselves alive. It is as basic as that. Anytime we would want to negatively impact a person's ability to earn a living so that the person can eat, so that the person can live, then we have become worse than animals. Anytime we get to the point where we want to negatively impact that, we have gotten to the point where we are acting worse than animals. And so I say, Mr. Speaker, that no human being can be part of that kind of thinking. No human being can be party to that kind of thinking. No person in the judiciary could be party to that kind of thinking. No person like me of faith can be a part of that kind of thinking. And Mr. Speaker, no government can be part of that kind of thinking. The kind of thinking that would seek to disadvantage a person, to hinder their ability to earn a living, 
and to feed themselves. No person, we, call, we, we talk about civilized, I'm not sure what that means sometimes, but no human being can be party to any kind of action that would disadvantage a person such as to strike to the root of their survival. The bill, Mr. Speaker, that is before this honorable chamber, a bill to protect persons from discrimination relating to employment has some history. We have now come to this point, but I need to point out that many years ago, back I think in as early as 2004, there was a recognition that persons living with HIV and AIDS were being discriminated against. There was a recognition back in 2004 that that discrimination was doing exactly what I said that human beings really cannot be party to. That discrimination was impacting the ability of human beings to earn a living. And so it was impacting the ability of those human beings who were living with HIV and AIDS from being able to eat on a daily basis. The government at the time agreed that a register would be established and that it would go, let's use a term, it would go hard against situations where persons living with HIV and AIDS were being discriminated against. As discussion around this topic continued, it was also recognized that people living with disabilities were also being discriminated against. In other words, their ability to earn was being negatively impacted. And it was impacting their ability to eat. And therefore, impacting their ability to stay alive except at the mercy of somebody else. And so it struck directly to the humanity of people because people were being put into a position where they could only eat if they had access to charitable giving, if they could get to a food bank, if they could get to the Salvation Army. All good causes. But Mr. Speaker, that is not the country that I would want to live in, where people have to be at the mercy of others when they are still, as it relates to their bodily ability and their mental capacity, still able to contribute, still able to earn a living, still able to sustain themselves using their own strength and their own means. And so the conversation and the discussions broadened to include not just persons living with HIV and AIDS, but also people living, persons living with disabilities. And as the conversation went on over time, it was recognized in those consultations that the whole matter of discrimination needed to be spoken to in its entirety. And so between the Attorney General's chambers and all the stakeholders, it was agreed in recognition that the ability to earn so that a person could eat was such a fundamental right, it was determined that the legislation to address discrimination should be located in the ministry with responsibility for labor. And much work was done over a number of years. There have been many meetings with the social partners over those years in terms of small groups, not the, 
the large official body, but small groups of the, of the partners, so that trade unions and employers' organizations have been able to contribute to the development of this piece of legislation. Well, this proposed, this bill, what is now a bill, proposed piece of legislation. Many comments, much vigorous discussion ensued over the years, and progress was made, albeit slowly, in getting us to the point where we could have a policy directive, and after policy directive, have a bill prepared. In more recent times, further to our, this government having established a social justice committee, the draft legislation was also discussed quite extensively at the level of the social justice committee. And that conversation represented for us a final full discussion because the Social Justice Committee is made up of workers' organizations, employers' organizations, faith-based organizations, and many other organizations in the third sector or civil society. So that in the consultation we had with the Social Justice Committee, we would have had discussion in that forum with public sector, well, with trade unions, sorry, with employers' organizations, with those who are government representatives, and with the broad civil society sphere. Those discussions resulted in us making the final tweaks to this piece of legislation, and I want to commend the hard work of the ministry over the years. I want particularly, though, to commend the hard work in more recent times, in the last two years in particular, the administrative officer who did quite a bit of work on this project the Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Labor and Social Partnership Relations, the Chief Labor Officer, and my very energetic Permanent Secretary. They have done human work in working with this, pushing it, ensuring that we could do for the people what we would want done for ourselves. That there would be in place in this country of ours, in a 21st century Barbados, a piece of legislation that would prevent me from being discriminated against, that would prevent you from being discriminated against, that would prevent the people in St. Peter and St. Michael Central and all across Barbados from being discriminated against in the area of employment. The employment that produces the income that is used for all of us to sustain ourselves. Mr. Speaker, the bill that is before us has a number of parts and a number of clauses and two schedules appended at the back of the bill. Part one of the bill, which when passed will be cited as the Employment Prevention of Discrimination Act 2020, begins, as always, in all pieces of legislation at section two with definitions called interpretation. It interprets business. It interprets or defines complainant. 
contract of employment, which has the same meaning as the Employment Rights Act. There is a synergy between this piece of legislation and the Employment Rights Act. Disability is defined in the bill. Discriminate and discrimination is, we will get to that in section three. Domestic partnership is defined. The relationship between two persons at least 18 years of age who live together in a domestic basis, but they're not necessarily married, but they're not married, sorry, and one is not living with the other in terms of giving care for reward, paid work. There is domestic partnership status that is also defined employee, employer, employment agency, family member, family responsibility, marital status, all defined in the act. Medical condition, minor, refers to the definition in the minor's act. Physical feature, and height, weight, shape, size, distinguishing mark, peculiarity, includes things like hair style, hair color, Anything physical on a person, respondent, tribunal. And like I said, Mr. Speaker, the Act has a synergy with the Employment Rights Act, and that is also spoken to in that section. Part two speaks to the fundamental issue, and that is discrimination. The bill before this honorable chamber, Mr. Speaker, says that a person discriminates against another person. So we understand that we are talking here about human beings. A person discriminates against another person. Where the person directly or indirectly whether intentionally or not, makes a distinction, creates an exclusion, or shows a preference, the intent or effect of which is to subject the other person to a disadvantage or to a restriction or to some other detriment. So that is how one way in which discrimination takes place. One person directly or indirectly makes this distinction, whatever the distinction is, that causes a showing of preference and that preference is intended or has the result of subjecting the other person to a disadvantage, to a detriment or to some kind of restriction. In other words, treating that person differently from if that difference, that distinction was not there. And then discrimination also occurs when as a consequence, persons with, there are a number of conditions in, in part B, but it speaks to the grounds now for discrimination. Those grounds I'm going to get to, and I'm going to go through them one by one, pretty briefly, but I think I need to mention them for not just this honorable chamber, but this is a piece of legislation for the people of Barbados, the people who have risen up against discrimination, who have said to us they do not accept that in the 2020 Barbados there should be discrimination, and for sure, not at the point where it affects their ability to live. The grounds for discrimination in this bill are listed at subsection or subclause 2 of clause 3. And you know, Mr. 
speaker, I have thought about this bill for the just over two years that I've been minister responsible for the portfolio of labor. And I've looked at this list on a number of occasions. And I have asked myself the question, for each of these in the list, I've asked myself the question, is it right for me to discriminate against another person because of? That is the question that I've asked myself. Is it right for me to discriminate against another person because of race? Is it right for me to discriminate against another person because of their origin? Is it right, Mr. Speaker, for me to discriminate against another person because of their political opinion? I will not discriminate against the Honorable Member for St. Michael West. I will not. I will not. I don't think it is right. So I, I will not. And he has my word on that. Is it right, Mr. Speaker, for me or for the country to discriminate against a person because they are affiliated to a trade union? Now, this is a matter, and I, I don't want to stray from the, the essence of the bill. But I need to say again to the country, I need to say again to some employers, and I say I qualify by using the word some because I'm not referring to all employers, but I have to say to some employers that we are not going to tolerate you getting rid of people at work because you find out that they become members of a trade union. We are not going to tolerate it. As a matter of fact, we are continuing some work in our ministry in conjunction with the trade union movement to make sure that we strengthen our trade union laws in this country. Because, Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, all of us are human beings, and we are not to be discriminated against because I don't agree with you or because I don't like the organization that you want to join, those, that, that, those days are long past. They never should have existed, but those days are long past. Should I discriminate, Mr. Speaker, against a person because of their color? Should I discriminate against a person because of their creed? No. That one is one I would get on real bad about. Because creed speaks to my religious beliefs. And anybody who knows me knows that I don't often get angry. But I have taken a little bit of license. And the other member for St. Michael West can tell me if I go on down the wrong road. But when the folk, when the folk were misusing the temple, Jesus was a very cool, calm individual. But the scriptural record that I believe tells me that he, he made a whip and that he tumbled over all kinds of tables in that place. He got real agitated, upset. Some, some people of faith don't like to use the word angry, but I don't know what would cause me to turn over tables in here. I'm not even going to ask the question. I am saying definitively, I will never accept discrimination because of the creed that I hold to. I will never accept discrimination in employment as a result of my religious beliefs. You know what translates to, Mr. Speaker? 
I know the reason why I am totally opposed to discrimination in employment for any grounds. There have been Seventh-day Adventists who have been denied employment opportunities because they will not work on Sabbath. I've grown up understanding that. As an adult representing the people of St. Peter in this honorable chamber, I will never be party to discrimination of anybody. I, I can't do it because I believe in the golden rule. I treat the people as I want them to treat to me. I don't want to be discriminated against. The Honorable Member of St. Michael Northeast, the Honorable Prime Minister, often says when we speak about some of these things that, and I am very happy about it, the Honorable Member for St. Michael West knows about it as well. I have been allowed, while a member of a party where I am a minority, I have been allowed to freely practice my religion. I have not been discriminated against because of my creed. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I will press on. I, some of my colleagues want to give trouble to people who are close to me. I will not accept it. But Mr. Speaker, will I, is it right for me to discriminate against a person because of their sex? Should I discriminate because, a, well, I'm a man. Should I discriminate against the member for St. Michael South Central? I don't think I would. I, I don't think it would be successful. But would, I, would it be right even to attempt it? Is it right, Mr. Speaker, to discriminate against a person because of their sexual orientation? Is it right for me to discriminate? Let me, I, I, I like to make these things very personal. Mr. Speaker, and I, I'm not scared to, to, to say what I have to say. Is it right for you to discriminate against me if you felt that as a man, I preferred other men? Would it be right for you to discriminate against me for the purposes of my employment because you felt that way about me or because I said that about myself? Is it right to discriminate against a person because of their sexual orientation? Is it right to discriminate against a person because of their social status? You know, Mr. Speaker, my right honorable predecessor was really very strong on this matter. Growing up poor in Rose Hill, buying secondhand books. This is what the Right Honorable Owen Arthur, this is his story. Secondhand books, walking to school, being poor. Is it right to discriminate against a person because they were born? on the next side of the road because they were born into poverty because of their social status? Is it right to discriminate against a person because of their marital status? Is it right? Single people versus married people versus divorced people. Is it right to discriminate against a person to, to block their employment? to stop their promotions, to reduce their pay or pay them in a different, at a different level from somebody else because of their marital status. Would it be right, Mr. Speaker, to discriminate against somebody in Bank Hall 
because of their domestic partnership status. Would it be right, in other words, the person does not attend All Souls Church, the person has not seen a church door, they may not agree with what I consider to be adultery or fornication. But Mr. Speaker, because a person is living in a house with another person in a relationship, an intimate relationship, a partnership, should I discriminate against that person in terms of their employment? Should I stop them from getting a job? Should I hinder their chances of promotion? Should I pay them at a lesser rate? Should I discriminate against a person because she becomes pregnant? That in 2020 may sound as though the answer is obvious. The answer to that question was not always so obvious. And those who have been pushing the rights of women over the years know that and have spoken to that in our social justice committee meetings and consultations. People discriminated against because of pregnancy. As a matter of fact, some people discriminated against because they may become pregnant and hindered from job opportunities because, well, when they become pregnant, then you have to give them time off because of leave and discrimination. Mr. Speaker, in a 21st century Barbados, there is no room for that kind of discrimination. Discrimination, and I, what I spoke to included maternity. Is it right to discriminate because of maternity? Is it right to discriminate against a person because of family responsibility? Just because my mother is in her mid-70s and I may have to help to take care of her, should I be stopped from getting a job because I may have to take care of her? Should I, be, should I be refused a promotion to a supervisory position because she lives with me and I will have to take her to the doctor or the hospital from time to time? Is, is discrimination in employment acceptable? Should I be discriminated against because of a medical condition? And generally speaking, Mr. Speaker, the answer to that is no. We're going to come in short order. I, I promise not to be too long, but to some exceptions, some exclusions that are important for us to understand as we speak to this bill. Should I be discriminated against? Is it right for me to discriminate against another person because they're living with a disability? Is that right? Is it right for me to discriminate against another person because of their age? Is it right for me to discriminate against another person to hinder their opportunities to earn a living because of a physical feature? Here, style. Are any of those things right. That is the place, Mr. Speaker, that I come from as a person of faith. I ask the question, is it right for me to? When I ask myself the question on these 18 items, the answer that I give to myself is that I have no right to discriminate in the area of the provision of employment, the pain of wages remuneration, the ability to earn promotion. I have no right. And I believe it is not right to discriminate on any of these bases. It is not right. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, there's discrimination, but you would remember that last week, I think it was, we 
lead to make a public document the two, well, two documents convention 190 and recommendation 206 which speaks to violence and harassment in the world of work and mr speaker we laid those two documents as the prelude to a national discussion on how we will make sure that we eliminate not just discrimination but violence and harassment in the world of work and the reason why i mentioned violence and harassment but particularly harassment is because a person may not be discriminated against in the way that the act speaks to discrimination but that person could suffer harassment and the reason why i mention that at this point is because there are two and have been too many situations where persons have employers have not discriminated against they have not imposed detriments or hindrances but they have so harassed people that the people have decided to leave employment in the establishment so that the employer cannot be accused of discrimination but the employer has succeeded in having the outcome that that employer wanted in the first place i repeat i do not believe that the majority of employers in this country go down that road but there are some and everyone is too many and we will know that we've laid in parliament the convention the ILO convention last year and the recommendation and this is one that the chief labor officer no chief labor officer i think then deputy chief but no chief labor officer acting chief labor officer and i worked on quite a bit in the sessions that were held in geneva last july and we will be having discussions with our partners just that like we always do we are a party in government that believes in speaking to people and moving forward with people on board and so i'm just signaling to the sectors or partners that we will be convening meetings to discuss how to ensure that all aspects of the convention are included in our legislation some of it already included sexual harassment for example um, there are certain laws that already speak to violence but we will be speaking to make sure that in the 21st century barbados we are living and working in a country without having to deal with these primitive notions of harassment and violence and discrimination and all those negatives that should not be attending a modern society so those mr speaker are the grounds for harassment as proposed in this bill i want to draw our attention to subclause four of clause three and this subclause gives some further explanation to the matter of discriminating based on creed and it starts with for the avoidance of doubt a person discriminates on the ground of creed where the person directly or indirectly whether intentionally or not subjects another person to any disadvantage restriction or other detriment because of the person's appearance or dress and that appearance or dress is required by or symbolic of the other person's creed and i think it is important in a society as ours 
a society where there are people of varying faiths. A society where there are people of faith and people of no faith. It is important for this explanation to be included because there are times when a person's appearance or a person's dress is required by that person's creed. And this act speaks to ensuring that a person is not discriminated against because of their appearance guided by their creed or by their dress guided by their creed. The bill speaks to the bill speaks to prevention of discrimination in relation to job creation and recruitment. So there is protection or there is intended to be protection against discrimination, not just for persons who are already in the who are already workers but persons who are applying to join the rank of workers so that an employer shall not discriminate against a person in the creation of jobs, making arrangements for who should be offered employment, in the ad advertisement of employment, determining who should be offered, the terms and conditions for persons who are to be employed. So there is the matter of not discriminating at the point of job creation and job recruitment. There is also a clause that speaks to the prevention of discrimination in employment, where the person is employed. There is that clause six, the prohibition against against testing, but that is subject to an exclusion that I will come to mm -hmm. in section eight. But the prohibition against testing for medical conditions. A person is, and if I can, maybe I shouldn't do this, but if I can use Dr. Martin Luther King's construct, a person should be judged in the execution of anything based on ability. Based on ability. Not based on whether or not I am hypertensive, but based on my ability and my capacity to execute the particular set of responsibilities. In Clause 7, the this was discussed, debated, in consultation with employers. Clause 7 speaks to the employer to make reasonable adjustment. And this bill, I believe, Mr. Speaker, to be a very balanced bill. Balanced because it asks employers to make adjustments, but it speaks to reasonable adjustments reasonable adjustments. So any adjustment we're asking the employer to make is within reason. And I just want to share some of those, some of those adjustments and the, the clause, so clause two of clause seven speaks to, for the purposes of subsection one, adjustment includes, could be others, but it includes allocating some of the duties of the employee to another person if that is reasonable in these circumstances. Altering the hours of work of an employee, if that is reasonable in the circumstances. Allowing the employee to be absent during hours of work for the purpose of assessment, rehabilitation, or other treatment. And le let me, just by way of example, because I think this allows me to speak to reasonableness. In a situation where a business has a single employee, then a person who has a chronic condition, who is likely to be away from work for extended periods or frequently, it may not be considered reasonable if that is your only employee 
to have that person in a position where the person feels almost compelled to be there even when they are, as we would say, sick like a dog, right? So again, the bill is couched like law generally in the idea of reasonableness. Provide the employee with alternative employment if it is possible, if it is reasonable. Assigning the employee to a different place of work. Modifying procedures for testing or assessment of the employee. Modifying instructions or reference manuals with which the employee is required to comply. Acquiring or modifying equipment for the use of the employee. Making adjustments to the premises to be used by the employee. Training the employee or arranging for the employee to be trained. Now, that this would have to be in this bill tells you that we are on a journey, but we're not there yet. In 2020, we should not have to say to employers, we should not have to include a clause that says training the person or arranging that the person be trained. But we live in a real world. And we understand, as one reader character says, we understand how school keeping. We, we understand what is out there, what is happening. And so we include training the employee or arranging for the employee to be trained. Providing a reader or interpreter to the employee and providing supervision for the employee. Those are some of the adjustments that employers are asked to make if they are considered reasonable in the circumstances. That is the form of words used at clause 7.1. As may be reasonable in the circumstances. And I think, I know that the employers of the country understood that this was not a list that was meant to be onerous or a list that was meant to put them out of business. And that is why we said reasonable in the circumstances. All things considered. Now there are some exceptions that are found in part three to this bill. And these exceptions are important. Genuine occupational qualification. Now, the example we sometimes use is that there are certain vision requirements for pilots. There are certain reflex requirements for using certain pieces of machinery. And this bill, and hopefully soon this act, is not designed to be so focused on eliminating discrimination that it puts a worker or other people in jeopardy. That is not the intention of the bill. And so if there is a genuine occupational qualification, then adhering to those requirements will not constitute a discrimination, an act of discrimination. And at sub clause three, a qualification is a genuine occupational qualification where it is an inherent requirement of a particular position. And there are some other sub clauses, but I just want to say, for example, it is understood that in security services, the searching of women, if it is a pat down, is to be done by a woman, in spite of what any man may feel. The searching, the patting down of a woman is to be done by a woman. That is accepted. So to say that, to say to a man, you cannot search, I'm not putting you to do that. He cannot claim that he is being discriminated against. There are some areas of counseling and areas also in terms of the care 
of minors and the care of girls where there are certain restrictions and those restrictions will not constitute a or an act of discrimination. Unjustifiable hardship. I think we spoke to, to this earlier. If uh, I spoke to reasonable in the circumstances, if avoiding a discrimination will impose an unjustifiable hardship, then it is not considered to be discriminating in employment for the purposes of this act. The matter of, and, and those who fight, and it should be all of us, who fight for equality across the board, measures intended, and I'm still in the area of exceptions, the third one at clause 10, matters intending, intended sorry, to achieve equality. Measures intended to achieve equality are not considered discriminatory. So that, for example, if an action is designed to promote equality of opportunity for disadvantaged groups, that act is not considered discrimination. It is, however, only to be in effect for so long as it is necessary for the attainment in the circumstances of such equality of opportunity. So once equality has been achieved, once we get to that equality, if we continue, then that becomes discrimination and an act of discrimination. The care of minors, and as a government, we are very careful and clear about this matter. As a matter of fact, the, the matter of the, the, the issue of children and child rights has taken quite some discussion at the level of cabinet and more will be said about that by others later. But as a government, we recognize our responsibility to our children. And so if an action that would otherwise be considered discriminatory is reasonably necessary to protect the physical, psychological, or emotional well-being of a minor, then that act, that process, that procedure, whatever is done, is not considered to be an act of discrimination. At Clause 12, Mr. Speaker, religious bodies, and at Clause 13, educational institutions administered in accordance with particular religious beliefs. And I want to, I, I think the country, and I think the leadership of the 47 churches in my constituency would want me not to spend all day, but to quickly read through this, because it is important to them. It is important to me as well. Discrimination in employment, according to this act, does not apply as it relates to the ordination or appointment of priests, ministers of religion, or members of a religious order, the training or education of persons seeking ordination or appointment as priests, ministers, etc., the administration of a body established for religious purposes in accordance with the precepts of that religion. And fourth, any other practice of a body established for religious purposes that conforms with the precepts of that religion or is necessary, and I, I want you to hear this, um, Mr. Speaker, as a member of the All Souls Congregation, <laughs> as is necessary to avoid injury to the religious susceptibilities of adherence to that adherence to that religion. Things, actions that speak to preserving the religion, the faith, 
the denomination, its belief, are not considered by this piece of legislation to be discriminatory. Educational institutions administered in accordance with particular religious beliefs, the same principles hold for, religious, for educational institutions that are administered in accordance with religious, particular religious beliefs. Religious appearance or dress, this one was interesting. This was a clause where we had to find some balance. There are some requirements that persons have in terms of dress. There are also, and at the same time, issues, for example, in occupational safety and health, where attire of a certain type may put the worker in danger. And so if for the purposes of the safety of a person, in other words, suppose B1 actually speaks to without endangering himself or herself, himself or others, if the attire or the appearance will cause or pose a challenge to the safety of the person, then an action not to place a person in that area of responsibility will not constitute an act of discrimination. Charities, and this, as you would know, would be of particular interest to me and to the ministry I have the pleasure of leading. There are many civil society organizations that have been established to address particular issues so that there are organizations that have been established to address issues of homelessness. There are charities that have been set up, civil society organizations, to address the challenges that sex workers face. There are civil society organizations that have been set up to address matters relating to children. And so, at Clause 15, matters that would otherwise pose challenges or be seen as acts of discrimination will not affect a provision in a charitable instrument for conferring benefits wholly or mainly of persons of a particular sex, race, creed, disability, sexual orientation, medical condition, age, age group, etc., marital or domestic partnership status, pregnant women, spouses of domestic partners of a particular category, if there are if we are conferring benefits on groups that the civil society organization was set up to confer benefits on, then those actions are not considered to be discriminatory for the purpose of this bill. In the area of sports, we have, beside the thunder, we have in sports, there can be determination that persons of a certain sex only can participate in a particular activity so that if it is the boys 200 meter on the 18, then only boys. So section clause 16 speaks to exclusion as it relates to sports, sporting activity. The intention is to 
make sure that there is not an inequality that is established where persons may pose an unfair advantage to others if there was not that allowance to prevent persons from getting involved where they should not get involved. That relates to everything, including age groups that is spoken to at subclause 3. Clause 17, and I need to wrap this up. But at clause 17, the visual and performing arts, there is sometimes necessity. This subclause, this clause includes modeling as well. And it, it, it was specifically referred to. And Mr. Speaker, like I said before, like I said very often, these inclusions are the result of the discussions and the engagement with our partners that allows us to see things that we may not otherwise have seen. And so if there are specific requirements for certain artistic expression, visual arts and performing arts, they are not considered to be discriminatory. Insurance, they are factors that affect insurance coverage. If those factors are adhered to and they're based on actuarial studies and that kind of thing, those are not considered to be discrimination. We spoke about pregnancy before. Now, I want to end, I want to wrap. The enforcement of this bill is through the Employment Rights Tribunal. And I said at the beginning that this bill is to be read very closely with because it is very related to the Employment Rights Act. And there is that synergy that exists with the Act. And so many of the provisions, many of the provisions will mirror what is in the Act. But there is the matter of complaining, and I, I think I need to point out, I don't think I said this before, a complaint can be made by a person, the impacted, affected person. It can be made by their representative, including a trade union. It can also be made by a third party, somebody who sees the discrimination and brings it to light. The organization has a responsibility to inform the person against whom the complaint is made. The employer ha also has a responsibility to investigate the complaint, has that responsibility. And Mr. Speaker, this was not meant and is not meant to put any additional pressure on employers, but we have said that this is to be in writing. And we know that writing also includes electronic media. So an email is considered to be in writing. The schedule two, just let me skip there. Sorry, Schedule 1. Schedule 1 of this bill, first schedule, content of policy statement against discrimination. Every employer is to have a policy against discrimination. That policy is to be made widely available, made known to all persons who work in the establishment. And it is against that policy that complaints will be made. And I already said it can be made by the person or trade union or third party. The chief labor officer is the route or the route, depending on where from Barbados you are. The chief labor officer is the route or the route through which we go to the employment rights tribunal. And I want at this point just to repeat uh, an error 
that some people seem to have in the back of their minds that you can go directly to the Employment Rights Tribunal. The Act, and sometimes I wonder how people read pieces of legislation. It is very, very clear that the Chief Labor Officer has a role. And I'm talking about the Employment Rights Act itself. The Chief Labor Officer has a role, a time-bound role, but a role. 42 days, I think it is, six weeks. The Chief Labor Officer has a role, and that role includes using the Chief Labor Officer's best efforts to get to a solution to whatever the complaint is. And the Chief Labor Officer is not circumscribed, circumscribed in what those best efforts entail. And I say that, Mr. Speaker, because I had the unfortunate experience of a Chief Labor Officer in his attempt to use his best efforts. He asked me, Minister, will you help me? And I agreed to chair a meeting to help the Chief Labor Officer achieve a resolution. And an advisor to an employer said to me, I don't want to say it was silly, but the advisor said to me, the minister has no role in the act. I want to say to that advisor, and to all other very eager but sometimes unlearned advisors that the Act, the Employment Rights Act, does not indicate what the Chief Labor Officer's best efforts includes. It does not indicate. And as a matter of fact, if the Chief Labor Officer told me that she was going to bring Psyche Astra to assist in the process, I could not even go to the act to say, well, you're really not, I, I, I don't believe it's so serious. <laughs> I know what happened to Samuel. But I, I would not have any legal basis on which to tell her, you can't bring Seke Astra. So I know she's from your constituency, all of St. Thomas. But um, I have no legal basis for doing that. So I am just saying to those advisors and to those industrial relations practitioners, that the chief labor officer has by law the right to use his or her best means, whatever means, to achieve a solution a con through conciliation, but has a, a, a time frame within which to do it, after which it can be referred, it will have then to be referred to the Employment Rights Tribunal. I think I needed to make that clear. I also, all right, I'm not going to speak to, to that one. The, in part five, there is to be, and this is really where the discussion started in 2004, there is to be a register of complaints made under the Act. That was the original intention that remains a part of the act. The register shall be maintained in a confidential manner. I spoke already to the requirement for a policy. Every workplace is to have a policy against discrimination. And not having a policy is a serious thing. Because we believe that discrimination is a serious matter. And so not having a policy is subject, is an offense first, and is subject on summary conviction to a fine, a fine and possible imprisonment. I say that not because I want to focus on fines and penalties in this, but I say that just to say to the public, just to say to employers, just to say to businesses and other employing organizations, that we are taking this very, very seriously. Confidentiality is also to be taken very seriously. And so while not having a policy can subject you to a fine of $5,000, breaching the confidence 
because discrimination can take all, all kinds of forms, and some of the information will be quite personal. Contravening the requirement for confidentiality, the fine is not now 5000 but $10,000. And victimization is also prohibited. As a matter of fact, the prohibition against discrimination, sorry, against victimization speaks to possibly victimizing a person who made a complaint, victimizing a person who gave testimony in the investigation of a complaint, or victimizing a person who otherwise participated in an investigation, procedure, or hearing. That will not be tolerated in this country, and the fine for that will be $20,000 if contravened. The first schedule, like I indicated before, is a policy statement against discrimination. The second schedule speaks to the consequential amendments that have to take place in the Employment Rights Act so that the Employment Rights Act is fully in concert with this act and this act with the Employment Rights Act. Now, Mr. Speaker, I have gone on for a bit longer than I intended, but I found it necessary because we are saying to Barbados that we have reached the stage, and maybe long past the stage, where discrimination is a matter that can be condoned. Our people have said that they do not want it. We have agreed with them that it is not something that should be encouraged. It is not something that should be tolerated. And so, Mr. Speaker, the bill before this honorable chamber is a bill designed to prevent discrimination against people in relation to their employment, in relation to their ability to earn a living, in relation to their ability to survive as human beings in this country. And so with those words, Mr. Speaker, I beg that this bill be read a second time. Honorably the opposition. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. There are quite a few things said to me when I was much younger that I find it very difficult to forget. One of them is this. An elderly preacher said to us, rat poison is 98% okay. It is a 2% that will kill. Never forgot it. Rat poison, 98% okay. In terms of the ingredients that are going to make it up. But it is a 2% that gets the rat. It's a 2% that will kill. He was trying to make us to have an appreciation for something called sound doctrine. To be able to discern it and to appreciate it. I say that simply, Mr. Speaker, to say my concern about this proposed piece of legislation is the 2%. The 2%. That potentially 
who will kill. We have to ask ourselves when we discuss bills which are brought to this house, measures which are being proposed in this parliament, what is the ill we are trying to remedy or to cure? And so I ask that question, what is the evil we're trying to extinguish? What is the ill we are trying to cure? Do we have a problem, Mr. Speaker, with people in Barbados not being able to get jobs because of their sexual preference? Is that a reality? Do we have a problem with people in Barbados not being able to get jobs because of their sexual orientation? Is that a reality in Barbados? If it is, it is news to me. Do we have a problem with people in Barbados because of their sexual preference or orientation being denied care at the QEH? or medical care in any public institution? Do we? If we do, that is news to me. Have you ever heard of a case, Mr. Speaker, of anybody being denied a license to drive in Barbados because he is homosexual, she is lesbian, do we face that reality in Barbados? Is that an ill that we must address? Has sexual orientation or sexual preference ever been known in Barbados to stop people from opening a small business if they so desire? Has it? I am not aware that it has, but Mr. Speaker, you are more aware of what goes on in the public square in Barbados than I am. You are far more enlightened than I can ever hope to be. Far more informed than I happen to be. Are we stopping people from access to tertiary education at the university because of sexual orientation or sexual preference? Is that a problem in Barbados? That if you go across the campus of the University at Cave Hill, you will not find anybody who is differently sexually orient oriented or orientated from the norm, what we call the norm? Is that a reality? In Barbados, sexual preference, sexual orientation has never been known to stop anybody from being elected to the Parliament of Barbados, highest institution in the land. When you offered yourself and you visited the many people in Savannah Road and Park Road and all those Royal Avenues in Bank Hall or the other side of Bank Hall, or the avenues of Goddings Road, or Adin's Village, or Sealy Land. I know the place, I come from there. Did anybody ever ask you, but Mr. Holder, what is your sexual preference? What is your sexual orientation? Did any of them consider a qualifying criterion before they would decide to give you a vote, Mr. Speaker, is that the ill we're trying to address? I have never heard it said, and I sat there for a little while, that you can't be appointed to the cabinet of Barbados because of any prejudicial position, re sexual orientation. That doesn't stop you from being appointed to the cabinet of Barbados. 
By the same token, it doesn't stop you from being deselected either. Or fired. What is the reality? What is the ill? What is the evil? We are trying to address with this. Let me make it clear, Mr. Speaker, I don't believe that we should be discriminating against people. Not even with respect to sexual orientation or sexual preference. We should respect people as people, treat them as, as part of this vast landscape of humanity. Treat them appropriately, properly. So before anybody goes out of here and says to anybody he believes that we should promote discrimination or allow discrimination where it exists to be perpetuated, let me make that clear. I don't believe in discriminating against people. I happen to lead a congregation. I happen to head a, de a denomination here in Barbados, a denomination across the region. And I'm part of a global administration of that denomination. I have had upfront experience of members of my local congregation who were sexually oriented differently from what is considered the norm. No discrimination against them. You treat them as persons. You may not agree with their lifestyle choice, but you treat them as persons. And when they come to the communion table, you do not say, I know how you live. So you cannot partake of the bread and the wine. Don't do that. Each and every man is responsible for his or her personal choice. So I don't believe in discriminating against people. But I do accept that that 2% in what otherwise is good legislation can kill can kill. I do not believe that simply because you do not want to discriminate against people that you must take the next step and institutionalize nastiness in any form. It is one thing not to discriminate. It is another thing to institutionalize any form of nastiness or institutionalize the advocacy, the advocacy and promotion of values which are foreign to the idea or the idea of being Barbadian or of Barbados. What we are seeking to do, in my view, with this bill and one that was previously brought to this house, is to institutionalize a certain value set that is at odds with what I understand to be, to be in Barbadian values long held and cherished. And we should not do that at all. And we should never do it to give effect to or serve narrow personal agenda interests. So I being promoted on my, well, I didn't actually see it. I was told of it. Promoted on my television screen recently. And there are those who shout loudly in advocacy of certain departures from 
values long held. That's the 2% in this legislation. The 2% in this legislation that carries the poison. We can't, by subtle or subversive means, seek to institutionalize anything that erodes the Barbadian value fabric. Because it seems to me, with what I've heard recently, and what I've seen appearing here, documented in this bill today and the one that came before, and I'm hearing of others to follow, it would seem to me that there's a subtle attempt to deconstruct family values in Barbados. To deconstruct family values in Barbados. To deconstruct the idea and the ideal of family in Barbados. It concerns me when in these bits of legislation we are reading about domestic partnerships referring to the relationship between two persons each at least 18 years of age who live together on a genuine domestic basis does not include any reference as it goes on to suggest the married couples or people living and looking after each other. It bothers me when I read of domestic partnership status, meaning the state of being a, a domestic partner or a domestic partner or the former domestic partner of a particular individual. It bothers me when it appears in these bits of legislation family member is referenced here in relation to a person, spouse, domestic partner. When I see these things, I'm bothered. In recent memory, when we looked at the remote employment bill, we had similar term, terms being sounded. It bothers me that these things constitute part of the 2%, the poison in the otherwise, perhaps some would suggest, the otherwise good piece of legislation. Now we are trying, we suggest, to ensure that people are not discriminated against on the grounds of race, that is fine. Origin, and that is fine. Political opinion, and that is fine. We come back to some of these things and trade union affiliation. These things are fine. Color, creed, sex. Well, that's as far as we go. But when you move from sex or gender, the sexual orientation, I take pause. Social status, marital status, when you start to talk about domestic partnership, status in the context of how it is defined in this bill, I take pause. Pregnancy, maternity, family responsibility, age, medical condition, physical features, etc., etc., etc. Those things are fine. But in those specific areas that refer to domestic partners and partners and other types of, of constructs that are at odds with family values and family ideals in Barbados, which, is a, which, which constitute the fabric, the foundation, the bedrock of Barbadian society, values upon which you were honorably raised. Mr. Speaker, I take pause because I think I see in that a 2% that has the potential to kill in an otherwise good piece of legislation in so far as my limited intellect can decipher. Mr. Speaker, if government wants to cross that frontier, 
that threshold, if government, want, if government wants to step into that space where no government before today has dared to tread, well, let the government say so in clear terms and ask the people if they want to go there with the government. But there should be no subtle underhand behind the back subversive attempt to deconstruct to undermine that which that which has strongly underpinned Barbadian society Barbadian values if you want to go there say so so that the world might hear if you want to go there Tell Joseph Hathley, yes, we want to go there, and we're going there. Or if you choose not to tell him, tell the rest of Barbados clearly that, so that he perhaps might overhear. But that is where this government wants to go. Because you're interfering, it's, as far as I can see, Mr. Speaker, in these subtle forms, fashion, with the definition of family. You are seeking to, to deconstruct a platform of values long established by your parents, Mr. Speaker, and mine. And I suspect by the parents of every other individual in this honorable house. You're seeking to deconstruct that values platform long established. I will want to repeat it. Because not to discriminate is one thing, but to institutionalize what I consider to be a foreign value frame is not where I want to go. But you can try to institutionalize it by use of force of numbers. That's the circumstance which now obtains. There are 28 over there. And one over here. And you are the impartial pair of ears. The impartial heart. The impartial brain. In this honorable space. So the force of numbers circumstance can help you to do it. But if you want to do it, say so clearly. And tell Barbadians you want to do that. And see if they approve. You're looking to, in my view, when you do this, erode both a cultural and a Christian ethic long internalized in this small country. It's not only Christian, you know, Mr. Speaker, because they'll do, there are those who will dismiss it on that basis. But it is cultural as well long ingrained in the Barbadian psyche that there are certain things you should not institutionalize even though you do not discriminate those who are given to participation in those things or partaking of those things. I suspect it's not only a Christian ethic but if you go to the religions across the world you will find that it is a religious value a religious ethic that we seek to deconstruct and to discard. Mr. Speaker, we import a lot of things. They say we import most of what we consume. We import most of what we consume bodily. We import most of what we consume in terms of, of our of our at our attire and all that goes with that presenting ourselves properly to the world we import all sorts of things the institutionalization of anything like this is a foreign import that we can do without there are lots of other values as well 
that we've imported from abroad. And some have served us fairly well, and some have not served us well at all. And this is one import that this small country can do without. Some suggest that there are lots of things we have to do these days as a small developing country and a small open economy if we're to, if we're to survive in this world. Some suggest there are all things that we must do which are forced upon us. And there are those from without who are seeking to force this type of initiative upon us. And there are some who would suggest in relation to that last bill, for instance, that there are a lot of economic financial benefits that we will miss out on if we don't go down this road. But, Mr. Speaker, I humbly suggest we should try to avoid any form of national economic prostitution. We can't just sell ourselves for what the world has to offer. We can't just sell ourselves for what the world has to offer. You know, Mr. Speaker, the foreign, the foreign dollar may have its value. But when it comes to these type of things, that value ain't high enough for me. I'm sure it's not high enough for you. That foreign dollar has a premium value for some people. But when you have to do things like this, in order to earn it or get it or come by it, that value is not high enough for me. And I suspect it is not high enough for quite a number of Barbadians. I say this with some degree of pain. But if the party now in administration, if this party has lost its soul, Barbadians, Barbados has not lost its soul. I say that. And I know I will incur the further wrath and ire of some on the other side and supporters on the outside. But if, but if this party has lost its soul and is therefore willing to sell itself in this sort of way. I dare to suggest that Barbados has not lost a soul. I will humbly say that there are those of you over there who must stand up at some point. Who at some point must stand up and take a stand and not sit quietly or idly by when some things are made to transpire. And this is a moment when the assaults of the outside world are made against the soul, the spirit, the value system of this country by these means and by these views and by these values and when those who are a part of us here in this country align themselves with this type of force with this type of assault then it is time that those in this place sent here by the people of this country to represent the interests of various constituencies it is time that you stand up and say, no, not that step. I am not going there. It's not good enough to absent yourself from the vote. It is not good enough to hide behind the procedure and suggest to yourself, I don't have to say a thing, either yea nor nay, because ultimately 
His Honor the Speaker will rule the eyes, have it. So it matters not that I say anything, but it is time, and this is a time, when you should stand up and say no. And perhaps you should even have said it before the bill came here. Perhaps you should have been saying it loudly all last night. No, no, no. It only takes 2%. To kill. I am not going there. We have to stand up for something. You should stand up on this. I don't want to I don't want to engage in any seeming cheap politics, Mr. Speaker. But I make this other comment only in light of the fact that the Honorable Speaker before me made references to the former Honorable Prime Minister and member for St. Peter. He made several references to him in very complimentary terms. And I don't want even to cheapen this moment. But I feel fairly strongly convinced that the former honorable member of St. Peter would, ne would never have brought this bill, not with this 2% in it, to this chamber. I really don't believe he would have brought this bill. You know, I remember, Mr. Speaker, years ago, when I was a part of the government on the other side, attending an event at what was then Sherburn Conference Center. And several hundreds of persons had been called together to focus on the matter of the spread of HIV and AIDS in Barbados, and in part, specifically, on how we could address that and reverse or counter any trend towards spread. And I remember it was mooted that at some point in time, Barbados would have to come face to face with discussion, the issue of legalization of certain lifestyle forms in Barbados, embrace homosexuality, prostitution, and that type of stuff. I remember that discussion quite well. And I remember it is etched in my memory. I can see the moment now. And I was standing at the back. And one voice of influence came up to me and said, but Joe, you can support this and still be a Christian. I have not forgotten it. But Joe, you can support this and still be a Christian. It was a voice of influence that spoke, that whispered that into my ear. But you know, Mr. Speaker, in that moment, I heard a voice of higher influence whispering far more loudly into the same ear, no, no, no. And it is still no. It is still no, because this 2% can kill. And I want, and I'm not being politically here, political here, I'm saying this because of what I honestly feel. I have tremendous regard and respect for the current incumbent honorable member of St. Peter. I do, I do. But I want to suggest to him humbly, this one will follow you for the rest of your life. It will become part of your perpetual legacy in Barbados. Not the 98%, you will be healed for that. But this 2% here, that will kill. And I adjure you, 
don't know how you would go about that. To pull back from this 2% that speaks to domestic partnerships and constructs of family relationships which are at odds with our current legislation and with our value set and value system. I think, I think, I think, Continue, I remember. I think that by institutionalizing, institutionalizing, Mr. Speaker, not, not, not discriminating against people because of their lifestyle choices, but I think that by institutionalizing unnatural, unnatural, and I mean that in the biological and scientific sense, lifestyle behaviors, we do our children a disservice. We do our children a disservice. We do our children. I will repeat what I said earlier when others who now tried to shout me down were not here. You don't deny anybody any privilege in Barbados at job or access to education or health care on the basis of lifestyle choices or behavior. But you don't go the next step and put in place an institutional architecture that will encourage it and cause it to flourish and be perpetuated, especially among generations to follow us, some of whom are our offspring. Mr. Speaker, you can follow this to its logical end. Where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line? When a man says, my pet is my partner, this animal I live with is my partner, sexual partner too, where do we draw? Yeah. By all means. By all means. Scoff. I just I, scoff, I just I would like to hear scoff. I would like laugh, to hear the scoff, member. Laugh by all means, Mr. Speaker. We all in here know what is happening in the world community about us. We know what the trends are. We know where the crazy people are going. We know what is being forced upon small countries dependent upon the generosity and the weary fall of other countries in this global space. We know what's happening. Anything, you know, we think it's far-fetched. You know, even in the most recent debate, I heard the same honorable member here refer to this. When a man comes and says, this is my pet, we can tell he can't bring it. You know what's the logical next step? This pet is my partner. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when we move, when we move, to strange forms of lifestyle. When we move to strange forms of lifestyle, activity, and behavior, and institutionalize them, we're opening Pandora's box. The next thing you know, man is living with man under a, an institutionalized legal framework approved by this parliament. A man is living with man, a woman is living with woman, and our children learn those values until man one day decides, I want to live with my animal. Laugh, scoff, scoff, laugh, as much as you want. That is the world in which we live. You know what they say, very frivolously sometimes, Mrs. Speaker, well, the Bible, when they're scoffing at the Christian faith, when they're scoffing at adherence to the Christian faith, 
like my honorable friend from St. Peter, proud Adventist, when they're scoffing at persons of faith. You know what they say? The Bible that says homosexuality is wrong also says that adultery is wrong. And it does. And it does, Mr. Speaker. You know the difference? Do you know what the difference is, Mr. Speaker? We can research the biology and we will see the difference. We can research the makeup of the body, how this body is framed, and the uses of the organs of the body, and the orifices of the body. We can check that out, Mr. Speaker, and we will see what is natural and what is not natural. Because both may be wrong, but one is natural, comes of natural instinct, using naturally ordained means. The other one is unnatural. Laugh and scoff. Laugh and scoff. But in reality, as a legislature, this is where we are in today's world. And somebody on the other side has to say, no, no, no. That is not the way to go. Don't duck out. Stand up and be counted. I really think, Mr. Speaker, that those things are important. The 2% potentially will kill. You should not discriminate against people on the basis of gender or sex and that legislation should treat to that absolutely nothing wrong with that I think we have sexual harassment legislation in Barbados a legislation that seeks to curb that type of practice in the workplace and these are matters we have to address Mr. Speaker because it obtains at the highest levels in Barbados. And young women especially are harassed and exploited in the workplace. And that is a right and proper focus. And it is being done by people who are operating at the highest levels in private and public in Barbados. And that certainly should be a matter of concern to us. I observed to someone not too long ago with the circumstances of the negative outfall from COVID obtaining around us and employment levels having skyrocketed. Mr. Speaker, you know this. I'm sure persons have come to you as clients, you know this. They have come to me both in my political capacity as well as my pastoral capacity. Complaining about superiors in the world of work who want to harass and sexually exploit them. I can think of one for whom it created such stress. It drove her to serious medical complications, spent much time at the QEH, still trying to recover, happens. My observation suggested to me that with this inordinate increase of unemployment in Barbados, that situation potentially becomes worse. And what I am doing here is simply to, simply making a call that we use the legislation which is available to us and to the extent that we can improve it, improve it so that we may curb that kind of thing, not open the door for this 2% that potentially will kill. We have to be very careful. I, I heard some ZR operators, drivers, about eight or ten of them conversing together on Sunday morning, Mr. Speaker. And they were 
you know how fellows are. They'll make a joke sometimes about the most serious things, although they recognize that they're very serious. But it's a moment of levity, and that's the way they, and that is the way they focus on serious matters in a situation which suggests that is a jocular moment for them. And you know what they were saying? You know it's the preferred route now for ZRs in Barbados? Not Bush Hall. Your area. But Bush Hill. That's what they were saying. You know what that says? With all that is happening around us in terms of the economic downfall, the uh, negative outfall from COVID, economic decline, there's more activity. One guy said there are more passengers along the Bush Hill route than there are on the Silver Sands route. A reality. What legislation we have to ensure that people, especially our young females, who fall vulnerable, subject to the prevailing economic conditions, what legislation we now have existing that we can use to treat to that, we must use it. And where it is weak, we must make it more robust. That is where we have to go. That is a problem, an evil to which we have to respond. What is the evil we're trying to remedy here? We don't want to discriminate against people on the basis of political opinion. That's in the legislation. And that is good. Political opinion is a good ground for anti-discrimination legislation. But Mr. Speaker, there's a certain nastiness in our politics and in the culture of our politics that we have to acknowledge, confront, and certainly reduce until we can eliminate it. Because people in Barbados are quite aware that though we bring this legislation here today, that you can't discriminate against people on the basis of political opinion, or I suppose is intended political affiliation, etc., etc., etc. Hey, the truth is that is a practice obtains in our culture every day. With every succeeding administration in Barbados, we have this going on. That a fella gets a job or loses a job because of an attachment to a political party. It's part of the culture. You got to bring it to an end. That is an evil that we need to seek to redress. We have people in our system, public service system, who are superseded on the basis of party affiliation. They're known to be affiliated to a certain party. So somebody passes them out on the way up in the world of work and they lose out on opportunity because they are perceived to be aligned and they're people well-meaning people who would like to give vent to their political instincts or to give expression to their political impulses be a part of the the culture the practice the architecture politics in barbados people who want to do that but ain't gonna step out because to do so the political hammer falls on you. That is an evil we need to redress in Barbados. That is an evil. So it is all right to put in this legislation. I'm glad it is here. They don't discriminate against somebody for, for, for employment on the basis of political opinion, etc. But there are other aspects of discrimination and ill treatment of people and impartiality or partiality, depending on how you look at it, in relation to people and opportunity based on perceived political connections. So they work for you today, and tomorrow when the colors change, they work against you. And we have got to do something about that. Is it true, Mr. Speaker, and is it part of our reality that we are sending home one to recruit another? Is it true that when the, the certain color 
rules the day. You are sent home and someone else is hired to do the same job for which you were let go. And then another color comes into its place. The reverse takes place. These are realities that have to be addressed. We are changing the political culture. This government has the numbers to change these things in Barbados. And this is a now moment. Where the opportunity can be seized. Not to cement it, but to correct this ill. You are awarded contracts. You know this, Mr. Speaker, because of the party badge which you wear. You are awarded contracts based on the party badge you wear, on the banner behind which you march. These are realities that we must try and emit. A maturing democracy to eliminate from the process. Ultimate goal to eradicate them from the scene. So we place persons in key positions Positions of influence so that they can help us electorally, no matter who else is better qualified to do the job. It doesn't matter if entity A needs a CEO or manager, we put that place person there because that's a party loyalist. It doesn't matter that the other person is not, the other person is better qualified. I remember not long ago. When we had to deal with the matter of the CEO for the Quillian Hospital, I took a position. It does not matter to whom she is related. The ultimate consideration for me is can the person do the job as the person qualified for the job? I supported that person and that was in for that position. Because the principal perspective from which I come does not matter what color she wears. Does not matter to whom she is connected. If she's qualified for the job, capable of doing the job, and we have the means to remunerate. Well then by all that's my position in this business of putting party loyalists ahead of others who are better qualified is an evil that we have to address and as we seek to do this uh, eradicate or counter discrimination re-employment in Barbados we have to consider these other things as well trade union affiliation is another good ground as the honorable minister presented we can't be discriminating against people because they belong to a union, Union A or Union B, or Union C, or any union at all. And these anti-unionization practices in Barbados, we've got to bring the full brunt of the legislation available to us, improve it where necessary to bear on this situation. It is not sufficient to say that we are going not we are not going to be tolerant of any actions which run counter to the spirit of this industrial relations practice of allowing people to be organized as labor and to be represented by a union of their choice. We've got to go beyond the words. Just as we are providing for anti-discrimination legislation on the basis of union affiliation, we got to make sure that the practices which obtain, and, and in many instances, it is from the, the imported or foreign investor, but it also happens on the domestic front, from those who are at home investors, domestic investors, because they pressure people that they can't be affiliated with this, this union or that union. And that, that, that in 2020, in a maturing democracy as intelligent as the Barbados is, 
we've got to treat to that. And I would have, if I'm totally honest to say as well, that the practice of corrupting or compromising union leadership through partisan leadership relations or the adoption of partisan-oriented agenda, a historical feature in Barbadian politics, we have got to treat to that. Mr. Speaker, you know a relationship between unions and political parties in Barbados. You know the history of that day when the party now in office benefited from that. And then a long period when the party now in office suffered as a result of that. And in this modern day to which we have now come, upon which we have now arrived, we promote very much the concept of consultation, and that is good. But we cannot corrupt the process of consultation such that we compromise labor unions or labor union leadership. There's a growing current of belief out there that is happening in Barbados today. I like to be as frank, but as honest as I can. And I don't know that I have yet come to the point where I will stand up and say that that is true. But the appearance is there. The perception is there. The belief in the minds of many is there. And though we applaud that we ourselves seek to promote that the business of consultation consensus where it may be arrived at the whole issue of compromising people by the connections the connectivity the relationship between political leadership and union leadership political parties and trade unions is a thing of which we must be very careful and that, I think, could easily become an evil that destroys us. I want to say before I sit down, Mr. Speaker, we employ, we employ non-nationals in Barbados from the Caribbean CARICOM area and there are too many stories, too many instances of which is said that we do that because we can exploit such, <laughs> pay them less than we would pay the average Barbadian. And we sometimes make the excuse that they do better work when in fact they charge us less and that is the driving consideration. The speaker, when we do that, we demean those people, we're exploiting those people, and we're doing a disservice to the Barbadian worker. And that is a matter to which we must treat. Dare not forget it, because when you're talking about discrimination or non-discrimination in the world of work and an employer-employee relations, you are treated to these issues too because they are real. They are real. They are real. Not too long ago, once you came from Guyana, we will employ you because we can pay you less. We can hold your passport. We can't do anything with that. You know, still, you know, you know, problems. That demeans them does a disservice to the Barbadian labor force. And then we say, well, they're only taking jobs that Barbadians don't want. Barbadians don't want to work in agriculture, don't want to work in the field. Well, if that's true, let's find out why. Let's make the field a better attractive place or find more modern forms of agriculture that we may engage their interests. If things continue along the path they seem to be trending, the reverse will soon become a reality and Barbadians will be going to Guyana and being exploited because of the uptake of their economy and the downward slide of ours and it will demean us and be a disservice to them 
as a reality to which we have to treat. Poor working conditions. I get this complaint all the time. Again, through my role with the church, but also political capacity, especially from women, that they have to work under very poor conditions. And I'm glad that to some extent this legislation treats to that because an evil that must, redress, must be addressed where women are demeaned and degraded in the workplace and made to work in all kinds of conditions that are not decent. I see you nod your head, Mr. Speaker. You hear the same complaints as well. And we need to see that when businesses are established in Barbados as well, businesses of a certain size or businesses in a space of a certain size, that there's some obligation to provide facility for child care, for, um, for child care services. Government can do it all. Can do it all. The Honorable Member St. Thomas disagrees with everything I say these days, but I know she will agree with that. And we have to have... We, <laughs> uh, that too. And we have to have a <laughs> we have to have a situation you cannot have you cannot have a number of people seven eight hundred uh, people employed in a space and the businesses not feel a sense of obligation to be in part of the provision of a child care facility so that provides for access more immediately so to parents and guardians under whose charge they fall. It helps with productivity, Mr. Speaker, so you don't have to leave spot A off the job, travel four or five miles to get your child, take the child home and get back to work, that type of thing. And if that's something to be ridiculed, I re re regret to say I will not apologize for it. I think it is necessary. Mr. Speaker, I'm done, but my main thesis is this. I'm done for now. I'm done for now only because time is pressing on. But my main thesis is this. This is a good piece of legislation. There's a 2% in it potentially will kill. I'm against that 2%. I will vote against that 2%. And I hope that when we come to vote on the clauses, they are so called that I will be allowed to vote against that 2%. I will be forced to vote against the entire bill because I can't accept that 2% in here. And I really do want to encourage other members in here to take a stand. This bill is good. Extract the 2% that potentially will kill. I thank you. Honorable Member Mr. James North. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, would crave your indulgence on, on just two issues before I get into my support for this bill which is before your parliament today. First, of course, to join with the Honorable Member for St. Peter who has introduced this bill in uh, giving deep sympathy not only to this country and this region, of course, to the family of the late Prime Minister Owen Seymour Arthur, one of the most outstanding Barbadians ever lived. Um, his contribution to this country and region is unquestionable. I mean, the, the man for the times, as has been said, he led Barbados for almost 14 years at one of our greatest times of economic prosperity, um, reducing the unemployment of this country to 6.7%. As I've said many times before in this parliament, the lowest it has been since the abolition of slavery. His um, being the political leader, prime minister of the Caribbean at the forefront of the Caribbean single market and economy. And of course, Barbados at the time being the leader in terms of the establishment of the Caribbean Court of Justice and his 
the mere force with which he fought uh, the superpowers, regardless of the size of Barbados, uh, his stand on the ship Raider Agreement, for instance. Sir. But I know, of course, that this parliament will shortly have, I'm sure, the opportunity to pay uh, tribute in wider form to um, the late Prime Minister of Barbados, who, of course, was a member of this parliament for over three decades. Secondly, sir, of course, this is the first speech I'll be making as a government backbencher, so therefore, I have now served in every capacity um, as a parliamentarian, sir, starting as an opposition <laughs> member of parliament, a government cabinet minister, and now a government backbencher. So in terms of parliament, sir, I, I have to be now seen as an elder uh, uh, statesman, sir. And uh, certainly I would hope that my speeches are colored in that vein. Uh, but, sir, I, I really want to take the opportunity here now. And you know how it is, sir. The press calls you, and I, 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 you, you avoid them at a stage like this. But I want to take the opportunity to thank the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados for giving me the honor and privilege for 26 months to serve in the cabinet of Barbados, sir. Uh, look, there have not been 150 people who have served as cabinet ministers in this country since the establishment of cabinet government, sir, as we know, in the mid-1950s, what, 66 years ago. So, um, you're in still an exclusive group to have served or to serve as a cabinet minister, sir. No more than 150 persons. And uh, therefore, it's an honor and privilege, sir, which um, I will obviously carry to my grave, sir. There's no right uh, to be a cabinet minister. And a prime minister, of course, who wins all 30 seats has a difficult task. And uh, as I said, I was privileged to have served for 26 months and I will continue of course to support this Barbados Labour Party. Um, I will obviously still have a, a say in the bills and the legislation that comes before this parliament as a member of the parliamentary group. The, this act, sir, uh, as I believe the honourable member of St. Peter said a mention had genesis for a long time, so it might even have been, it, certainly it was conceptualized um, in the previous Barbados Labour Party government led by the late, now late, uh, Prime Minister Owen Arthur. In 2014, 2015, so I remember being, attending, I think it was two, two sessions, either two or three, uh, which the then government had organized um, and I would have attended of course as I think recognized leader for uh, stakeholders within the organization serving people with disabilities I was invited in that capacity and as I suppose sir, as an attorney at law who would have done a lot of work in terms of disability rights and the the last government in fact had a couple bills in draft. Um, one was on discrimination of employment, which were discussed at those sessions. This bill, which is before your parliament today, sir, is an expansion of certainly the prevention of discrimination in employment bill, which the last government was thinking of, and I believe it in fact combines um, two, two bills which were before them. And of course, like most things, the last government sat and did nothing. As I said, sir, this was 2014, 2015. And of course, they had three, three and a half years before election to bring in this legislation or similar legislation, and they didn't. But that's typical of the last government, sir. The definition, and, and sir, of course, uh, I'm going to concentrate on discrimination or prevention of discrimination against persons with disabilities, sir. I mean, my, one of my core policy areas, I know, of course, freer to speak, 
so on, on policy, no, not being a member of cabinet. And I, I will, um, as I so do, I think, hope at least give some enlightenment um, on, on certain areas. And uh, this, the definition of disabilities uh, in this bill, um, in section two is in fact the same definition as it is in the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, a United Nations Convention which the government of Barbados um, under the last Barbados Labour Party government would have signed in June 2007. And then the last government of Barbados, Democratic Labour Party, would have uh, ratified just after the 2013 election on the 27th of February 2013, sir. But uh, after a country signs and ratifies a convention, it, it really ought to bring the convention or, or the, certainly the tenets of the convention before parliament so it could become law. So I'm fully aware of the institutional systems which would have to be put in place to give people with disabilities the, the, the genuine facility of being able to take advantage of the tenants and provisions which are in the convention of which I speak, sir. And therefore, because of those fundamentals, I suppose, that, that um, we haven't been able to institute, sir, and, and, and when I say we here, sir, I'm speaking of this government because we came in a tremendous economic downturn, sir. Uh, and then when, when you're, you're recovering and starting to see the light, on comes COVID the last six months, and you're fighting then against that, sir. But really and truly, uh, the government owes, and I want to say this, people with disabilities, the opportunity to be subjects, to be parties to further legislation, disabilities legislation, enshrining their rights in conformity with the convention that we signed, both parties, sir, separate times as a government. Uh, on the issue of employment, we are here debating effectively the provisions of the convention in Article 27 relating to work and employment. And therefore, I commend the Honorable Minister of Labor for um, bringing this bill, introducing this bill to Parliament, uh, for the work that has been put into the bill in his ministry over the last two years. He, therefore, uh, um, the Honorable Member, is in fact legislating that aspect of the convention into Barbados law, section 27, and, and, and essentially all of the uh, provisions, sorry, in Article 27 of the Convention are being uh, provided for in, in this bill. Uh, the Convention, in fact, this defines what is discrimination on the basis of disability, effectively speaking, to the distinction, exclusion, or restriction on the basis of disability such that a person is impaired on an equal basis with others, and, and that theme is repeated in this bill, sir, is impaired uh, as to their human rights and fundamental freedoms in all aspects of their life, sir, whether political, cultural, social, etc. And, and sir, look, I mean, <laughs> uh, in, in a couple, uh, I think one, a recent speech I made in, in, in this parliament, I spoke about my background as a little boy in England, sir, to try to bring some understanding of where I come from. Um, but a lot of people seeing me might have thought that I had life easy, sir. And, and, and that's why I'm fundamentally against discrimination at all levels, sir. Fundamentally. And, and in this world, we know, including in this Barbados, people have been discriminated against because the quote-unquote too black or the 
or to go have quote unquote naughty hair. Or the quote unquote have four eyes, little children at school wearing glasses. And, and, and you're discriminated against and bullied because you're wearing glasses. Or you're quote unquote, uh, you're too short. Or quote unquote, <laughs> as I know full well, because you might have a, 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 a speech in list. I mean, I've stood in this parliament equal with others as an opposition MP to be told and to be mocked at by at least two then government cabinet ministers. Yes, that is the truth, sir. Uh, one was the then member for St. Michael South Central, de facto deputy prime minister of this country, and quite frankly, when, when, when he did that that day, I, I was astonished because I was absolutely shocked. I didn't, th I didn't think that he would do that, he of all of them. And I remember telling someone about that recently, and, and they said they didn't believe it. And they went and asked another former DLP cabinet minister from that cabinet, who confirmed that what I said was true. And, and in fact, that cabinet minister, to his credit, then cabinet minister said that he, he was disgraced. He really wondered what that member was about. And, and thank God he was beaten badly last election. Because, I mean, that, that kind of attitude, if, if a, a members of parliament, cabinet ministers, could discriminate on the basis of simple fundamentals that quite frankly, <laughs> are absolutely relevant and, and does not stop someone for trying to achieve the best of their talents, do good in society, serve their people to the best of their ability, sir. They have, those kind of people have no place as representatives at any level with, uh, with, with anyone, sir. And... Uh, Section 3.2 sets out all the grounds for discrimination in, in, in this act, grounds for discrimination. But I'm going to concentrate, as I said, sir, on disabilities. And uh, as it relates especially to discrimination in, in employment for people with disabilities, sir, we know that a large percentage of people with disabilities, substantial percentage, are unemployed. This government has tried to focus on their self-employment, sir, through, and, and have given the opportunity, for example, through the Trust, Trust Loans Fund, uh, which, of course, was established under the ministerial mandate of the Honourable Member for St. George South. Um, also, this party, sir, would have adopted a policy that 2% of government contracts should go to persons within communities and people with disabilities. But, you know, sir, you set policies of the government, but then you have to make sure that they're implemented, sir. And, and I'm not so sure that we have so far laid the platform where people with disabilities have been able to avail themselves, sir, of the very wise policy of this government to bring them into the mainstream in terms of award of government contracts. I believe more has to be done, sir. And um, I, 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 am, I can say, sir, that, look, we were going to, about to look at that, sir, because we had discussed that in March and COVID came along, and I know that has been set back, but I'm asking for it to be put back on the table because I mean, persons with disabilities are not naturally able to, to go and tender for these contracts. They need assistance in, in, in terms of, of the um, profile and, and the marketing and, 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 and the financials and other aspects, sir. And I think we have a duty to, to do that because we cannot afford to leave anyone behind in this society and as Mahatma Gandhi said, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. 
and on the political front, sir, this political party, which the Barbados Labour Party, won what 74 percent of the vote. Those voting, sir, I can tell as a fact, sir. I know, sir, that well over 80 percent of persons with disabilities who voted last election voted for this party, sir. I made sure of that, and I say no more on that point. And we have a duty to 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 a community which heavily, heavily supported us to ensure that they can get the benefit of these issues, of the policies that we have started to put in place for their advancement. Uh, but opportunity, sir, is what you need in life. And um, opportunity starts too with education. And I, the, the Honourable Minister of Education, the Member of Parliament for St. Michael South East, sir, for example, last year introduced a resolution into this Parliament uh, buttressing Ann Hill School. Sir, um, remember, monies were given to improve it, Ann Hill School just outside the pine, sir, and, or, or in the pine itself, sir. And I, I should also say that, sir, that, that when we talk about discrimination, foolish discrimination, sir, I should have mentioned to, because we know, sir, we live in, we're, we're representatives, whereby people are discriminated against because of the district where they live or where they're born, foolishly, that kind of thing. I went to school, sir, in the pine. My sister went to school there, too, at the Irving Wilson School. So we were, going, we were at school in the same compound. And, and, and this bill is about seeking to remove those nonsensical types of discrimination, sir, which still prevail among certain sectors in this country. And the Ann Hill School and the Irving Wilson School um, are, are still the only two, to my knowledge, sir, um, government special needs schools serving students who are between 11 and 18 years old and, and we need to buttress that and improve that sir because outside of those two facilities for children between those ages parents have to still pay for their special needs education of their children no i know yes government subsidizes the education financially in in a lot of cases but it should be as of right sir and it is something that that we have to as a government and as a country look at because these kind of issues define ultimately um, what is the good society and I mean outside of that for neurotypical children they have a wide choice of at least 23 secondary schools all of which are free uh, neurotypical children you know, who have some form of difference, sir. Um, they can go to the secondary school, sir, and, and that is free. So we have certainly made progress in that. But, but the education of the, the, the child who is differently able is paramount because if that doesn't happen, they're not going to have as, as much opportunity in employment which this bill is seeking to give them, sir. And we all know what someone might be have immobility issues, but that doesn't mean that the brain is is in any way affected. So in fact, the brain is better off than a lot of others in society who 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 pompousette and and play powerful and arrogant. That that's the reality, and and we have to be give they have to be given uh, the opportunity. Uh, employers should, shall not discriminate in uh, arising from this bill against an employee in terms of our conditions of employment that the employer affords the employee and, and that is extremely important sir uh, and shall not discriminate against a person in the creation of the jobs section 4 so and 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 Flexibility has to be given, as the Honourable Member for St. Peter said, in terms of the, the uh, 
accommodating the employee. I mean, an employee may have a child who has disabilities, and therefore, under this bill, provision ought to be made to accommodate such person who may have to take their child, um, what, once a week, once every two weeks for, for special treatment, sir. And, and, and you have flexibility. And, and especially now, sir, since we have embarked on flexible uh, work conditions, employment conditions with COVID over the last um, five months, four, four months or so, sir, I would hope that employers understand the need to be more flexible in this regard. Uh, the, the, as the Honourable Member said, this bill would be enforced by the Employment Rights Tribunal, sir. And uh, I, I would want to say, sir, that um, at least advise the, the Honourable Minister that he may have to look I'm sure at whether the Employment Rights Tribunal will become overburdened. Because the Employment Rights Tribunal, of course, as we know already, supervises the Employment Rights Act. At the time when uh, the Barbados Labour Party came into office 26 months ago, I am aware that they had about 270 odd cases that were outstanding before that tribunal under the Employment Rights Act. There was a hiatus before we, we got uh, the tribunals in place. Three separate tribunals, we know a nine-member com commission divided into three tribunals, three persons each. And we know they've been doing well. Perhaps the Honourable Minister may wish to, in his wrap-up, give the figures as to how many outstanding cases they have now, how many they have already heard uh, under his... Uh, ministerial leadership, sir. I, 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 I'm not a, I, I don't know those figures, sir. But I suspect that when this act really gets going, that um, there may be issues of, uh, you know, again, before the tribunal combining, sir. I certainly, as I seek to reestablish my law practice, sir, I, I certainly look forward <laughs> to be in before the tribunal on that, uh, on that issue. I, 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 I would have done, of course, the first case before the Barbados Court of Appeal on the, uh, on the Employment Rights Tribunal and won it, sir. Uh, was not able to go before the Caribbean Court because at that time I, I was a minister, sir. So I look forward to practicing some law under this. Uh, it, it, it is right. It is right for for exploration, sir, and uh, uh, and and therefore, I, I think, Minister, you might have to look at the uh, how the Employment Rights Tribunal may be able in the future to cope with this now new responsibility. Um, certainly, sir, the idea of the three the three months there's a time frame uh, of three months in which. The, you have to make a written complaint to the tribunal if you feel that you're being discriminated against in the workplace. And three months, as we know, sir, is not a long time. It is short. I mean, as, as you're fully aware, sir, in normal civil practice, you have a lot longer time, three years, four years, um, sometimes longer, six, to bring a civil procedure action. So three months is short. But thankfully, under Section 29 of this Act, uh, the tribunal can extend the time in, in which a written complaint has to be given depending on, on the circumstances involved. And, and that is good to have that flexibility. Uh, you, you have, of course, it's administered through the chief labor officer and sometimes you wonder if the three chief labor officer has too many responsibilities already. I suppose it depends on the good sense of the chief labor officer in terms of delegating responsibility to his officers on this so that he personally isn't swamped. Uh, but, and, and what, of course, sir, is interesting as well is that um, the act, at least in my submission, sir, also applies to government. 
because unlike the Employment Rights Tribunal, which at section 51 specifically says that that act, that the Employment Rights Act, sorry, does not bind the Crown, but applies to statutory corporations, um, this act does not say that it does not bind the Crown. So therefore, the implication is that this act also applies to government departments. Um, the Severance Payments Act, sir, as you fully, uh, uh, fully aware, in fact, exempts um, the public officers from the, and um, persons in statutory boards under the Pensions Act from being able to avail themselves of this act, of that act. But this act, um, the, the cabinet was, um, in its good sense, uh, did not say that it does not bind um, the Crown. So, so therefore, it binds the public sector as well. And uh, therefore, so the natural consequence of that too is that persons who are responsible for appointing people and selecting people for jobs, both in the government and private sector, have to become fully aware of their obligations and duties under this act, sir. And, and I trust that the, there will be information uh, channels to educate the public, government information service and others, as to what are people's rights and obligations under this act. And, and, and in fact, the, 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 in terms of employment in, in the private sector, sir, um, certainly I've said this many times before as an opposition MP, and, and both in and outside, well, before, as an, before being parliamentarian, sir, in my um, life as a, as a leader, in the rights of promoting rights of people with disabilities, there's a crying need for affirmative action in the private sector, in both private and government, sir. In, in, in the private sector, you can give incentives to employ persons with disabilities. So I, I say that in Jamaica, there's a policy that 3% of public sector jobs are reserved for people with disabilities, sir. We, we don't have that policy, it's a similar policy in Barbados, and I believe the time is right whereby we move to that kind of framework, especially if we are to make legislation like this meaningful for people with disabilities. Uh, uh, so la last week I spoke, and, and I believe I spoke with passion on on the issue, another issue, sir, because what? Half of the Honourable Leader of the Opposition speech was on the domestic partnerships issue, sir. And, and, and I'm freer to speak on this now, sir, than I was a week ago. What I said certainly does not bind Cabinet, sir. And I said, sir, that because of my background, I have to be fundamentally against discrimination, sir, in all forms. Because of my Christian background, sir, having been, yes, brought up in an Anglican church, sir, for, and baptized in an Anglican church, I must say, and I mean, I could not be truthful. My, my, my mother would want to disown me if I said otherwise, sir. That is the truth. So I, I can't, sir. I will never accept that marriage could be anything other than between a man and a woman. All right? So I start by saying that marriage must be between a man and woman, sir. That is the truth. I, I, I couldn't come beyond that in terms of marriage, sir. But in terms of discrimination, sir, I, I, and really and truly, <laughs> you know, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition has to sometimes think past uh, 
I, I want to be fiercer and, 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 and don't sound like if I'm being offensive. So the, the narrow concepts of, of um, religious tenets and tradition and what we derived from the Church of England, sir. A Church of England that, as I said before, during the debate on Black Lives Matter, sir, was highly discriminatory, that had black people sitting in the back of the church, sir, they couldn't go to the front whatsoever, that was discriminatory, whatever you say, in terms of education, in terms of where people lived on the church land, sir, you know, the back waters. And, and, and sir, I mean, because as we know, the church was part of the state of Barbados until it was disestablished in 1968. And, and, and we have to, in the year 2020, the third decade of the 20th century, accept, accept that there are people among us. All of us have constituents, sir. All right? That you go when election times come and ask for a vote. That have sexual preferences that may not be similar to, 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 to yours as a candidate. But you want the vote still. Right? But yet, you want to come as the honorable leader of the opposition and discriminate against them in the highest legislative forum in the country, sir. I can't stand for that, sir. That, that you're going to say that somebody should be denied a job because of their sexual preference. But that is effectively what we're saying. And I, I can't accept that, sir. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition spoke in terms that he doesn't know of those situations in Barbados. But, sir, but, but I don't know if the case is finished, sir. I mean, I, I, I was out of law. I, I, I'm going to get back into it now. But before the Employment Rights Tribunal, last year, sir, a case was filed because somebody was dismissed from a particular place of employment because they revealed themselves as being of a certain sexual identity. So, so I, I don't know <laughs> where the op leader, op honorable leader of the opposition lives, sir. But, but this bill is seeking to prevent that. And I have to stand firmly on the side of the bill because you know, none of us can stand here, as I said uh, last week during the Reward Works Bill, and play God. I am not casting judgment on anybody, sir, on their behavior. I can't. Because on Judgment Day, the Lord will make a judgment on me too. None of us are perfect. All of us have defects in, 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 in our beings. Sir, he who, cast, he who is without sin cast the first stone, sir. And, and I, I am not going to say that someone in St. James North must be denied a job because of a sexual preference, sir. Not in 2020. I thank you, sir. That is just, that is no different, sir. And, and, and you have all of, as I said in section 3, 2 sets it out. That is no different, sir, from when I was minister in charge of the police force. It came to my attention that under the previous administration, someone was denied promotion in the police force because they happened to be, a then, uh, they, they happened to be cousin of a then candidate of the BLP who is now a minister in this government. That's why they were denied promotion at one of the, the, the highest levels of the police force. And when I heard that, I was appalled. I was appalled that a police service commission could take that stand. And sir, it has to be highly condemned on any of these grounds. All of these grounds, sir, are in my opinion pertinent and relevant to our to the 
to, to where we are at right now as a country. So, sir, uh, I stand in support of this bill, sir, as now um, elder statesman, one of the elder statesmen of this parliament. I start by, I end by where I started too, sir, because one thing I forgot to say when I pay tribute. And of course, sir, like I said, I will have, I'm sure, opportunity in the near future to pay tribute in wider fashion to the late Prime Minister. I'm also proud, sir, to be standing here as um, Member of Parliament for St. James North, for which I will continue to be, sir, as long as the people of St. James North and the Lord are with me to be, sir. I am proud to be representative for some of the areas that uh, the late Prime Minister would have represented at the start of his parliamentary career, sir, namely Aston Hall, the Wim Road View, Baker, sir, uh, and part, part of Black Best, sir, the Black Best Pet Plantation, and, and the Honourable Member for St. Peter is laughing, and, and he knows why, sir, we had a conversation today. Uh, I, but I'm proud, sir, to, to, be, to be able to say that I represent, because in fact, um, 23, 24%, 23% of my constituents live in St. Peter, in, 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 in the parish of St. Peter, sir. And, and therefore, I'm proud to um, have that as part of my service to this country. I thank you, sir. I remember Mr. Michael Central, South Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I plan to be quite brief. I mm -hmm. raise in support of this employment prevention of discrimination bill. Primarily to share a few thoughts on this notion of values that has been addressed by the speakers before me, and in particular by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Sir, I, before coming to political life, started to observe, in particular over the years leading up to 2018, what it looks like when a person or a group of people who have been asked to lead and govern a people who have been asked to determine policy, who have been asked to be an example of development and progress, what it looks like when those people start to gravely lose touch with the people that they were asked to represent, with the people who gave them an opportunity to represent them. I saw a group of people in the last administration who had become so disconnected from Barbadian life and society and from the real things that Barbadians are concerned with that they thought that they could make these kinds of cheap political efforts to hold on to influence based on what they believed was the value system of Barbadians, or in fact, based on what they wanted to encourage as a value system among Barbadians because it was politically expedient for them. A group of people who had no platform, who had no ideas, who had not much to, to contribute. And so what we saw was that all they could try to draw on was this notion that Barbadians were primarily concerned with this value system that, that those people were ascribing to Barbadians. They did not realize, so disconnected were they, that they neither observed nor were they a part of 
the evolution of the country, one that started really to evolve and develop on a broader platform of social justice, on a broader platform of inclusion, of tolerance, and of love. That is the Barbados that I know. The Barbados that we saw when people started to talk about what it is that matters to them was one where people wanted to feel that they had a fair shot. And they wanted to feel not just that they had a fair shot, but that everyone was able to participate in the life that we were creating together. So when you lose touch with people, you start to miss their development and their evolution. I am proud of the Barbados that we are continuing to build and that is continuing to grow together because that Barbados has already started to reject discrimination in very strong and loud terms. They have already started to personally, in their own lives, reject that kind of discrimination. And what you will hear people say is, I want to live, and I want everybody to live. I don't care who is going in at you when the night comes. I want to make sure that the children that live in your house are getting an education. I want to make sure that my children have an opportunity. So I recall that one of the first conversations I ever had in St. Michael South Central was a young man in Carrington Village who ran up to me and said, I want you to deal with something for me. It's not for me, but it's for this old lady down the road. And he described to me this woman's living conditions. And he said to me, I don't want anything for myself. I, I, I can be good, I'm young, and I can work. But I want you to make sure that she can live a life of dignity. Sir, the kinds of slippery slope arguments that we start to hear when this topic comes up, that if you say yes to an adult person, you can say yes to a dog. These kinds of slippery slope arguments are intellectually lazy. Anybody can say that. Anybody can say, well, why not X or why not Y, and then you carry on down the slope in, 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 into the realm of things that just bear no resemblance to reality. And they are disingenuous because they start to stoke fear among people when really what we should be trying to do is to galvanize people around a value system that sees us all caring about each other and rejecting discrimination, rejecting intolerance. There can be no place for it in the kind of civilization that we are trying to build. And the point that the Honorable Member for St. Peter made in leading this debate is that you can believe what you want. You can live the kind of life that you want. That is at you. But you do not have the power or the right to deny someone an opportunity at anything that we believe is an important part of their development and their prosperity because you don't like what they're doing. That is the simple premise. And it is a premise, unlike what we have heard regrettably from the Honorable Member for St. Michael West, that has been embraced by future generations, by the next generation, by young people. The young man who started the debate about the removal of Nelson's statue, he represents a generation of young people who feel like 
the development pathway is not complete until we expand it to look at this notion of human rights. They are not satisfied with just getting by. They're not satisfied with just having, getting a job and looking at this kind of narrow set of economic goods and services as all we have to deliver for people. They want social justice and inclusion for all. That is what they want. Let us stop ascribing to them our own narrow and bigoted values because they are not their values. And they're the ones who have to decide the kind of world that they want to live in and that they will create. It is not just on the matter of racial inequality. It is not just on the matter of anti-discrimination in, in, in the workplace. Mr. Speaker, I have a niece who is six years old. And she becomes personally offended and wounded and traumatized by people littering. On weekend, she wants to know where is the next beach cleanup? How can she go and pick up the mess that people are creating? She feels so invested in the natural environment that she feels personally responsible for it. Sir, one of the reasons that I think that the member for St. Peter, aside from being the minister with responsibility for labor, is the perfect member in this place to lead on this bill is because he is a member of a faith, he practices a faith, that, you know, you, you learn a lot from sitting next to somebody in cabinet every week, that promotes not just the idea of religious freedom, but also the idea of stewardship. The notion that we, who happen to live on this earth for the period that we are given, are stewards of those around us, of the environment around us, for those who will come after us. And it means then that it falls to us to contribute to the evolution and to the knowledge and to the learning of these next generations and to create the space for them to determine the lives that they want to live. So the notion, sir, that anti-discrimination is an imported value in this Barbados, in this Caribbean that had to fight so hard for freedom in so many ways, that had to fight for suffrage, that had to fight for workers' rights, that had to fight for women's rights. That in fact, the, 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 the Caribbean women's movement was one of the global leaders in making sure that gender equality was something that we promoted. And we are suggesting that freedom is an imported value in this Barbados, not in my Barbados. I don't know where you live, sir. Not you, sir. But those who would say so. It is a lazy argument. This Caribbean region is in many ways the capital of freedom, and long may it continue to be so. So, sir, this perhaps has been the shortest intervention I've made in this place, but I simply had to rise in support of this bill, not just to say that it is important work, and I join the Honorable Member for St. Peter in thanking and, rec and recognizing the officers from his ministry who shepherded this through. It is groundbreaking work, but apart from that, it represents movement that Barbadians want. Those who have lost touch with the people who sent them here I beg them through you, sir, to try to reconnect and understand that Barbadians are tired of people getting unfair. It is in our DNA. We do not like it. 
Barbadians are the ones who are calling for this kind of change. And we owe it to them to make sure that it happens. I'm obliged to you, sir. Member for St. James Central. Mr. Speaker, sir, I vow that I will be no longer than perhaps 10 minutes, if so much. But, sir, I, I confess at the outset that I did not intend to contribute to this debate. But having listened to the Leader of the Opposition, I reflected long and hard on that which I can only describe as the tone deaf aspect of his contribution, which really was located in an obvious fear about the issue of homosexuality in this country. Well, Mr. Speaker, sir, I begin by simply saying that long before the U.S. Civil War, which I believe was 1861 to 65, there was a society of friends known as the Quakers, functioning in the United States of America and also in the United Kingdom, well, in Great Britain, staunch abolitionists all. And they formed a society, sir, which came to be known as the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. I ask you to carry your mind back through the years, sir, to the history of that society, and most important, to reflect on the symbol, because a distinctive seal was created. I first saw it when I was learning history at school, but it has always lived with me for three reasons. One, it is an African male. Secondly, he is on bended knee, shackled, wrist and ankle, in, a, in, in abject subordination. And underneath of it, sir, it carries the slogan, Am I not a man and a brother? At early stages of my adolescent life, sir, it jumped off the page at me. Because it provokes you to ask yourself the simple question that, quite frankly, my friend from St. Peter, the Honorable Member, asked us all today. And indeed, there was a period of time when we would have shared um, classrooms at the school that I have, I, I have in my mind. And, and therefore, sir, I am sure that he would have seen it in the same vein that I saw it. We have at some point to start to ask ourselves, is it right to discriminate against a person on the basis of the fact that they are different? Mm -hmm. And what I found startling about the contribution of the leader of the opposition is that he admitted that he agrees with the legislation in its totality, but for the 2% where his own personal chauvinistic prejudice creeps in and he then makes a determination a, a, a shocking determination, sir, on the basis of what he perceives is normal. But then the obvious question for me is who met he? How does he determine what is normality? How do I determine that it is abnormal for some person with a heart and a mind to love a person with a heart and a mind and for that person to love them back but those two people do not feel love the way I feel love for the person that I have married, for example. Or to be absolutely candid with the house, sir, the several times I've fallen in love before I got married. You, you don't want that off the record, sir. <laughs> You prefer no, that to be true. on the record? It is true that, it, if, if, Mr. Speaker, if you've only fallen in no, love... No, if it's on the record... If you've only fallen in love once in your life, sir, no, sir I, I feel on, sorry for you. It is on the record, sir. It is on but the it record. Is, it, is, it, is, it is a matter, sir, that, that while we, we are jovial about it, is real. We cannot determine what is normality for anybody 
And I think that for years, people have gone through this thing. You read the history of how the thinking has evolved. And some people have said that there is a, a mental problem with a person. And there is some sort of social, some, some scientific, biological deficiency with a person. I am not interested in that. I said in this house a couple of weeks ago, sir, and I mean it. I have no time for those things. Perhaps I'm not getting too long in the tooth. And maybe the time has come for me to think long and hard about continuation in this business. But for me, Mr. Speaker, sir, it is about people getting the food to eat. That's what I'm here for. Helping a man get through in life, get a job, feed his children, be able to put, put them through school, make sure they're in good health, Mr. Speaker. So that's what it's about. I do not presume that I have any right to reach into anybody's bedroom and make a determination on their love life. And quite frankly, I have not heard anybody make a, 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 an assessment of a member of this place on the basis of the ability that he or she may have to be able to reach in to anybody's house and determine who should live in there with them or sleep in there with them when the night come. So if we get into that, sir, we are getting ourselves caught up in a vortex. I believe that this society is made up of a cross-section of views and values. I know that this society has been a crucible, let me be frank because I say I'm going to be brief, a crucible of oppression. None of us in here can say that this society has not been bitterly oppressive to black people, sir, to poor people, Mr. Speaker, sir, to poor black people women in particular, Mr. Speaker, sir, to poor black men. This society is rooted in, in class in a, in, a, in a vicious way. If you're born to a certain class in the history of Barbados, sir, we all know that you struggled in a way that you did not struggle if you were born in a different class. It is a happenstance of birth. Nothing to do with the, 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 the two different children who come out of different wombs at a different stage in life. None to do with them, but that is what they inherited. One for the better, one for the worse. Our task, Mr. Speaker, sir, is not to perpetuate that in any way, shape, or form. Nope. Our task, I suspect, must be to try to bridge that inequality, that crucible of inequality and oppressive conduct and attitude towards our fellow man that created this society that we live in. And if we are going to make anything in my humble and respectful submission, sir, of this journey that we have in public life, then it must be a journey that brings a sense of equality, an egalitarian perspective to the new Barbados. And that new Barbados must respect the crucible that we were born in and shaped in of oppression and discrimination. And once you understand that that exists as a reality, then you go and fix it. Yeah. And you can't selectively cherry pick how you're going to fix it. I cannot say that I'm going to fix the oppression and discrimination on the basis of the fact that people are poor and, and, and how do you discriminate against them. And, and people are born with a black skin and you, how you should not discriminate against them. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm not going to also deal with the discrimination on the basis of religious creed or discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or discrimination on any of the other bases we know exist in Barbados? Who makes it right, sir, to say that it is wrong to, to, to do, to, to try to rectify certain types of oppressive and discriminatory conduct in a country, but you must leave other types dealt with and corrected? Who makes it right? Who, who decides that? How do you pick the discrimination from the sky and say, this one is to be fixed, but not that one? And if that other one is not to be fixed, must it endure forever? Could that be right, Mr. Speaker, sir? So I share the view of the Honorable Member for St. Michael South Central when she said that it is a form of intellectual laziness in the argument. I think I go further by saying it is really intellectually bankrupt as an argument. And it is, it is beneath the dignity of this house in the year 2020. I, I, sir, perhaps have earned myself, for better or worse, the reputation of being a rampantly heterosexual male. 
So perhaps I can say these things without fear of contradiction. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, sir. The, huh? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, sir, that that, that does not mean that I cannot respect the right of someone who is not heterosexual to love the person of their choice. In the same way that, sir, I must respect the right of a person who makes a decision that, and as, as other countries anywhere have allowed them to do, that this is the partner that they want to have for the rest of their life. But has, that I can't get into that, Mr. Speaker, sir, because nobody chose your partner for you. And nobody would choose mine for me. And the day that anybody tried to choose my partner for me, it would be problems, Mr. Speaker, sir. So let us not then get into this, this, this very unfortunate and artificial atmosphere where we can just say it is normal to love somebody, but abnormal to love somebody else. Who made the person to do that? On what basis do you define that normality? Or abnormality as the case may be. Because we all have heard the reasons and the rationalizations behind it. But you know, Mr. Speaker, sir, the data, anybody has a child. Anybody has a child. And that child come home and say, Mommy, even though I am a girl, I have fallen in love with a girl. You may not like that your child has said that, but I do not know of the mother or father who can consciously and deliberately and willfully say, I love you no longer simply because you've fallen in love with a girl. Because it would say a hell of a lot about you as a parent. And if we are not going to do that to our own children, Mr. Speaker, sir, why then do we feel we can sit in the People's Parliament and make these prescriptions about the people who have elected us to lead? When in every household, Mr. Speaker, we know there's people who have friends, there are people who have family, there are people who have a combination of friends and family. They may even have acquaintances or somebody that they know about. That is in the same boat of what we're talking about. And all through all 30 of our constituencies, Mr. Speaker, sir, all of us know that there exist those relationships. So are we going to sit here and say that we are going to bring a bill to stop discrimination across Barbados and all 30 constituencies, except for people who have fallen in love with people in the same, of the same sex. But that would be a form of midsummer's madness to come here on July 28th to do that on a rainy night, sir. So I, I, I honestly believe, sir, that you know, I, I support the, the, the piece of legislation, but I see that it has gone, the debate has gone hopelessly awry because of the very unfortunate argumentation, if you can call it that, of the lead of the opposition. Um, I think it is, a, it is rooted in the Victorian age where you would tie somebody to the stake, make sure that their feet are surrounded by coals, set the coals of fire and burn them to death and stone them in the process because, Mr. Speaker, sir, they have fallen in love with somebody of the same gender. Yes, all these things used to happen. You hang them and then when they're done hanging dead, you're still going to draw them and quarter them because they can't dead enough. Mr. Speaker, so when does it end? When does it end? Because as I say, anybody who has a son or a daughter that come in the house and say, Mommy or Daddy, though I am a son, I have fallen in love with a man. Though I am a daughter, I have fallen in love with a man. I don't know that any parent, though they may not like it, though they may get angry about it, though they may be disappointed about it, can simply say on that basis, I don't love you as a child anymore don't know how it can happen. And if it can't happen then, Mr. Speaker, so we can't come here and legislate on the basis of discrimination against people when the bill itself is to bring an end to discrimination. It is a form of absurdity that I cannot be part of, Mr. Speaker, sir. And that is my contribution here in the, e the evening's lesson. Honourable Member for St. Philip North. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Truth is, like the Honorable Member for St. James Central, I had no intention of speaking about this tonight, but the 
the bit has, has gone far away now and they feel it necessary to make my contribution. Somebody mentioned in, on Facebook about Dr. Brown. I wonder if she has anything to contra. Brute, brute, what was it? Brute. B R U T E. So I hope I don't fall into that realm tonight. But a few things with respect to this legislation. I want to applaud the member for St. Peter for making it as thorough as he did. There are obvious things that obviously I support discrimination against race and origin and color and creed and religion. I could associate with the with the honorable member for St. Peter when he spoke about the Adventists. I have worked with many that were for, forced to work on Saturdays actually. I am not sure how they view medical people, but they were for, for, forced to work on Saturdays to keep the job. Um, it's a pity that, that it does not always apply to other religions where some people work on Sundays, but it's not taken so strictly then. I agree with no discrimination against the sex of the person. Male, male and female should have equal opportunities. Years ago, in here, we never looked like this with so many females. And as they say, we have, I say crap, the glass ceiling with respect for uh, women in the parliament and indeed the workforce. I have no problem with trade union affiliations. I know businesses here that for fear, for the employees' fear, they are silently, is silently suggested that they do not join a trade union because they fear for their jobs. I know offshore companies here with the illness and discrimination against medical issues and illness that one day off the employee is forced to go to a doctor for a health, a health certificate where you could spend eighty dollars for just missing a day. Things like that need to be looked at, and you believe the honourable member will continue to do so. The fact that we are putting legislation in place to protect people that may become pregnant or are pregnant would have just had babies, would have, would have had children that they may need to take sick leave for. I, I experienced a bit of it when I first entered political life. I think it was the only place I saw it. Where eyes would roll if I mentioned my daughter having to be late for a meeting or couldn't come. Maybe eyes rolling closer than you may think. I am glad to see that that is freeing up. But that being said, it's okay to say that we won't discriminate against people taking a day to look after a sick child or a child that might not necessarily be sick, but what are we putting in place to see that these people, people will be protected? The, the first, second speech I made in here, for instance, we would have spoken about, I would have sp spoken about workplace crashes, some daycare at the workplaces that mothers can actually, and in some cases, single fa fathers can actually come to work comfortably knowing that their children will be safe. Political opinion, I'm happy to see that there. Indeed, that needs to go from both perspectives. In other words, what I'm trying to say, as the Honorable Member St. Peter said, you should be taken at your value. If you're qualified for the job, it's yours. However, from the other perspective, there are many constituents, supporters, that expect a job because they're supporters. So looking at from both ends is, is a problem. There are many supporters that expect it because they, they, they bargain the vote. I will give you a vote if you give me a job, and me and a lot of them came wrong for that, apart from the fact I don't get many jobs open to me. Um, medical conditions, I want to get back to that. Just to bring up the fact that one mention of it, I, I'm seeing on the immigration form for people that want to move and work in Barbados, one of the requirements is to have a syphilis test, which for the life of me in my last 23 years in medicine, I did not see the relevance of it. To some extent, I can see the relevance of a chest x-ray, but certainly not a syphilis test. Maybe we look at, need to look at that, because I don't see what that has to do with a person moving to Barbados. It still exists on the, the antiquated forms. You may have a look. Whew. 
Disability, I'm glad to hear the Honorable Member for St. James North speak about this, but I want to say at the same time we need to put measures in place to train slash educate these people. I have a few Down syndrome um, members in my community, high functioning Down syndrome, we would have seen them overseas. There are many Down, Down syndrome people that are actors and actresses. I have met many high functioning Down syndrome residents in Barbados who is clear that they have the capability to work in a store, but they lack the training. Um, I think we need to do more on that front. I know many that could help out in the shop, help clean the office. We need to put measures in. It's okay to say we won't discriminate, but they have to be fit for the job. <clears throat> a little cold in here, I'm sorry. I want to say we are protecting the employees, but at the same time, I would wish to beg the, we are protecting employees, yes. I would wish to beg them, though, to be a little more considerate to employers. I represent one of the boards, um, NAB. I know many people that sit on boards. And I have noticed that a lot of the sit days are on Fridays and Mondays, which is a little strange. Most of the sick days with the repeat offenders, I use offenders, Fridays and Mondays. Something is a little strange about that. So although we are protecting the employees, we still have to be to bear in mind that the employers sometimes see, sorry to say it, but see hell in terms of the workplace. I am forced to bring up the issue that the honorable member of the opposition did. It's not a part of the legislation, but I would like the member for St. Peter to make it clear, not only for my benefit, but for the benefit of the public who is watching this, what he refers to as domestic partnerships. Reason being, I am aware, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm aware that the homosexuality on the law books is against the law. So it kind of confuses me a little bit what I'm supporting. Because if that's against the law, how is it that we're seeing anti-discrimination here? I do not discriminate against anybody that is, what is it, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, I forget some of them. I do not have a problem with them. They're allowed to have any job once they're qualified. I meet them every day. Some of them are my friends. But I am seeing a clash here with the written laws of Barbados and what this legislation is saying. Teeth knocking, sorry. Um, and I think the member for St. Peter, it would be helpful if he, if he qualifies it in terms of what he means by domestic partnerships. I listened carefully to the Honorable Member of the Opposition and the Honorable Member for St. James North. And I have to say, and I reiterate, I do not discriminate against non-heterosexual people. But I have to stand up now and say I do not agree, and it's not in the legislation yet, but for some reason I feel it coming. I cannot agree with same-sex marriages, probably because of my background, same-sex unions. I don't have a problem, I don't care what you do behind closed doors. But at the same time, it cannot include only these 30 people in here. It has to include the right wider community before we just sit up and discuss how the Honorable Member for the Opposition is wrong, or the Honorable Member for St. Philip North is wrong. We have to involve the wider community on this. I cannot support it. I was not brought up in this way. I have a problem. Let me just get a little warm. <clears throat> I have a, not so much a problem, but I have a battle. When I turn on my television, with my daughter sitting beside me, she's seven now, and every single Sure, 
involves something of the non-heterosexual nature. And I am forced to explain and explain. And she's going to ask me, Mommy, is this right? What's wrong with this? And she would have heard of it in school before even my input. Nobody talked to call and say, well, do you mind us teaching this to your children about different families? These are realities that we have to face. Regardless of what I think personally, or what the other 29 mem 28 members think, but these are issues. I have had calls from religious people, pastors, constituents that are fairly up in the church, worried, worried about this coming, or what they perceive as coming legislation. <clears throat> I watched a program the other night, was it the People's Business? And I was a little disturbed by the fact that I only represented of half of what the matter was about. I felt it should have been a little more balanced, and that's what we need. We need a balance, regardless of if we are afraid of if people vote for us or not. We need a balance. We need to hear all views. We, um, traditionally, this is a religious state, Anglican and many other religions, and we need to take the views of these people before we can talk about this legislation. I support the I support the legislation. I just want clarification on that matter. I I had to. I remember I had one conversation with the now late Prime Minister in Arthur one and he had called me after a speech I made in Parliament that was a bit controversial at the end of it he said to me Sonia you're gonna get a backlash but keep your head above this storm and as long as I live I will never forget him saying that to me he says stick with your integrity and say what you think once you do not offend. They might be offending some, but this is how I feel. I cannot. I have to stand up for some things. If not, I will fall for everything. And this is my issue with the legislation. Other than that, I think it's a fantastic piece of legislation. Um, congratulations to the Honourable Member for St. Peter. And here is where you take my seat. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want at the outset to commend the Honourable Member for St. Peter for bringing this very revolutionary piece of legislation. Um, I know that work had been started by a previous administration. Um, I don't think that there is much divide amongst either of the political parties, including the one that the leader of the opposition represents, as it relates to a belief that as a society we should be intolerant to discriminating against people on a number of grounds, whether race, sex, sexual orientation, um, age, or any of the other things which are common for people to discriminate against persons for. Having had common ground by both parties in relation to that fundamental principle, the Honourable Member has risen to the challenge and brought to Cabinet the revisions to this particular piece of legislation to allow us as a Cabinet certainly to approve the bill that is before this chamber. Now, sir, I recall in 2016 a document which has been made a document of this house called the Covenant of Hope, which at the time the Honorable Prime Minister as leader of opposition would have indicated to the country and certainly to all of us as young members, young members, whether opposition or persons aspiring to public life, that as a political party we needed to determine what we were prepared to stand for, what we were prepared to fight for and therefore how we were going to transform a Barbadian society 
that certainly had come out of the bosom of a colonial um, era, but one which we understood that both society and economy needed to be transformed if we were going to take this country forward. And all of us, sir, signed on to the principles espoused in the covenant of hope, including the same leader of the opposition. And one of those principles, sir, was a principle which reads as follows. That the Barbados Labour Party stands for fostering inclusiveness, mm -hmm. civility, and respect for diversity amongst our citizens. It went on to say, sir, that our politics must be guided by the underlying belief that every citizen matters and deserves the right to become the best that they can be. Sir, I start there because I believe that we have not gotten here by chance. There are some who may not be totally comfortable with discussions of this nature, but I want to remind this house and I want to remind this country that we got to this position in terms of being able to bring this type of legislation and even to have discussions on black lives mattering in this country because we stood on the basis of a principle and a foundation. We stood on the basis of a renewed understanding of who we were, where we were at that point in time, but also as a people where it is that we needed to go as well. And a part of that understanding, sir, meant that it could no longer be business as usual as it relates to how we interface with each other, how we interface with people of different races, how we interface with people um, of the different classes across this country. So therefore, this piece of legislation, sir, did not fall out of the sky. It is grounded in a philosophy, which is basically saying to us as a people that we have to be tolerant. And all of the pieces of legislation that have come in this chamber in relation to anti-discrimination have had a common threat. And it is that we have to be able to teach tolerance because it is only when we are tolerant of each other and tolerant of our differences that we are able to get the best out of our people. I have often said, sir, that you know we cannot find all of the value in any out of any one political party because Barbados is a small society. I've said it from the time I entered politics, I will continue to say it. We came to office with a landslide victory of persons who were frustrated with what they heard within the, the Democratic Labour Party at the time and wanted a refreshing change, wanted a government that was going to respond to what the people were saying. Not simply to be a government that continued to hold up the status quo or to be conservative or were, was full of hypocrisy, sir. We came to make a difference, to be able to give people of all classes, all races, everybody an opportunity to be able to be the best that they could be, sir. And I want to remind this country that that is what brought us to office. That is what is carrying us as we, be, we, we, we sit down and we try to determine the type of legislation that we want to carve out for this country, sir. And that is what will continue to drive each and every one of us in this party. I have a responsibility, sir, to teach tolerance through education because if we don't start with teaching our young people tolerance and understanding that this is a different generation from the generation certainly that I grew up in. Luckily, I came from a household where I was taught to be tolerant. I was taught even to be tolerant of people who didn't share the same political ideology that I may share and that I grew up with. I was taught to be tolerant of people who shared a different religious ideology than I did as well. And I was taught as well that regardless of whether persons chose to have a partner who was of the same sex, that I was also so, to be tolerant because, sir, I was made to understand that when I open my Bible, my Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. That's what my Bible says. So all the preachers that want to come and talk about, we want to take a percentage of what the legislation says and put it one side, and the rest of it, we believe that that is nastiness, sir. I don't know what Bible they are reading. But my Bible tells me, I must not judge, lest I be judged. 
It tells me I must do unto others as I would have them do unto me, sir. So I could not find it in, in, in any way plausible to be able to explain how I could, not, could support some parts of this legislation and be dismissive of other parts of the legislation, sir, because that is not what my foundation has told me. That is not what my foundation has told me, sir. I recall a time, sir, when the former prime minister was also forced to take a stand in relation to human rights. Forced to take a stand because it was clear that there were some members of his cabinet that was, well, he, they were uttering things that were not consistent with equality and non-discrimination. It was unfortunate that one member of his cabinet at the time made the comment that he had the freedom to advocate gender-based discrimination in law and to speak out against the freedom of any group of Barbadians. That's what one member of the last administration said, sir. And the then prime minister didn't agree with everything he said, but sir, he said on, on this particular occasion something that I so totally support. He said that whether homosexual behavior derived from nature or from nurture, mm -hmm. it does not lay within our competence to sit in seats of judgment and to condemn those who pursue that practice, sir. That is not the words of Barbie's Labour Party. That is the words of the former administration and the former prime minister in defense of what he understood to be a slippery slope that a Barbados would be going on if we started to discriminate against people as the honorable uh, former member would have indicated. You can't discriminate against people on any basis, sir. I want it to be made clear that this issue is one that may not sit well with people when we speak about discrimination. People want to be selective about what they want to agree to and what they don't want to agree to, sir. But I want us to go back to the late Nelson Mandela and reflect on the fact that sometimes, you know, we like to talk about Africa, we like to talk about calling all of these leaders and stuff in our history, but we don't understand sometimes from the position from which some of these people have struggled and the perspective which they have brought to a better understanding of the way of life and the way we must interact with mankind. Nelson Mandela fought against the apartheid system. But when he came out of prison, he also denounced all forms of discrimination. Discrimination on the basis of race, sex, age, sexual orientation, everything. Now we will want to associate ourselves to African society. We will want to say that we are associating to the Bible and the Bible says this and the Bible says that. But the man who lived through an era where he saw what discrimination did to his own race, the man that we all turn to in the struggle against apartheid and look up to, was able to say, you know what? This is not right. And if it is that the Europeans have discriminated against us as a black race, I cannot be a party to continue discrimination in any form. He didn't say he wasn't going to discriminate against Europeans. He said he was not discriminated against anybody for any reason, sir. Those are the things that we must take away from the people in our history that we look up to. We can't select some of the things that Nelson Mandela said and some of the things that he didn't say. We can't pick and choose. We can't pick and choose some things out of the Bible that, we, that is convenient when it suits us and other things that we take away when, when it does, it's not convenient to us. It doesn't sound right. Sir, I believe in principle. And that's why I started. I don't intend to be long on this, but I do believe that this particular piece of legislation is based on principle. We must teach tolerance of our young people. There's a lot of ignorance. Mm -hmm. I remember speaking in the other, when this house was in the other place in Bridgetown, and speaking to the way in which sometimes even our, um, our legislators spoke to each other across the floor and spoke about the examples that we were setting within the chamber to our young people. We're asking them to behave a particular way, but they are watching us in the House of Parliament, not me, but others, 
carrying on and, and, and being derogatory towards other colleagues within the chamber, sir. We have a responsibility to, to set a framework upon which people can be tolerant, that people will understand that everyone deserves an opportunity to be able to work. That's what this legislation is about. This legislation is not about nobody's sexual orientation. It's not about who living with who. It is simply about saying to people who live differently or do things differently that they have a space, they have an opportunity within this small society to be able to, to, to reach their full potential without fear of contradiction, without fear of ridicule. In a society that for generations has always said that we are open to all. We don't ask people when they come through the ports of entry, well, well who, who's your partner? Do you, you live, you're in a domestic partnership, are you in a, a union other than marriage? Because the money, when they spend the money, the money good regardless of who it's coming from. What we are interested in, sir, is creating a society that is fair, that is just, that is balanced, that is respectful of other people. Sir, and that we can all live together in a harmonious way. Those who are fearful of what is out there, sometimes it has a lot to do with, with their own ignorance. Because you have to understand that this generation out there is exposed to everything and anything under the sun. Does that mean that we have to continue to shield them from what exists? I remember leaving Barbados and being exposed when I went to the UK to all kinds of things all kinds of things that I was perhaps guarded and protected when I was in Barbados. It didn't change me. It made me realize that there was a different world out there. But I had a foundation and what I will say to those who are fearful of the realities of differences and, and, and people doing things differently is that you have a responsibility to educate yourselves. You have a responsibility to educate your children. You can't behave as though you live in a bubble and that the world uh, around you does not affect you because our children are going on the internet they are seeing things that are happening across the world they are interfacing with, with other people other people from other countries sir and they are exposed for us to behave as though we must now shut down lock down we must not talk about these things sir i think is a backward step and i commend the honorable minister for being able to bring this piece of legislation. It falls on the heels of the Black Lives Matter debate. I think it is very timely in terms of being able to send a very strong message that this party is committed to making sure that we transform lives, not just in a financial way, sir, but also in a social way. Okay, it, it is no, there is no point pretending, sir, that we have, all of our young people are in church because they are not. But what the churches have to do is to get into the communities to the children and to be able to teach them the morals and the values that many of us came up with. They have to become the persons who reach out to the communities and embrace and not make it difficult for children who don't have the, the right clothes or the right shoes to be feel a way about going into the, uh, the, the house of the Lord, sir. Those are the things that we need to be doing instead of telling children, no, you can't do this and no, you must shield you from these things, sir. We have to be able to open up and to let our children know right from wrong and to teach them the values and the morals that are necessary, sir. But not to make them fearful of what is happening in our society. So, sir, legislation like this is intended to be responsive to what we are seeing in our society. We are not follow patterning anybody across the world. We have never been a country or a government, certainly a Barbados Labour Party administration has never been a government that follow pattern. We have blazed our own trail, we have set our own benchmarks, and we have continued to fly our flag the Barbadian way because that is who we are, sir. And I assure you, and I want to assure the public that this piece of legislation has been given tremendous thought. I know that the Honorable Minister has consulted with several organizations, private sector, the churches. He's consulted with a number of um, employer organizations as well, sir. That is what we said we would do. We never said we would come and shove legislation down anyone's throat. We did it with the integrity legislation. We've done it with every single thing, whether it's Nelson, we, whatever we have done. We have said we will speak to the people, we will consult with the people, sir. 
And if people feel that there should still be more consultation, you are free to engage in more consultation, sir. But what we will not do is pretend as though this does not have to get passed to be able to give comfort to people who are scared, who are uncertain, who, who, who don't know whether they have rights. We need to define rights so employers know what they must do, how they must accommodate people who may be different and also that the employees or potential employees understand when they are being discriminated against as well. That's what this piece of legislation is about, sir. That discrimination isn't something that you just talk about when it suits you or that you pick out the pieces that you want but you discard the rest. Discrimination is discrimination. Whether it is age discrimination, sexual orientation discrimination, height discrimination, whatever it is, discrimination is discrimination. You cannot pick and choose, sir. So I just wanted to enter the debate to support the, the Honorable Minister in bringing this piece of legislation. As I said, it, it, has, it has had the support um, of pre, the previous administration as well. I know it was a, a, within the slew of pieces of legislation that was intended um, to be brought to ensure that we were compliant with our international regulations and our labor laws, uh, whether it was the sexual harassment or all of the Employment Rights Act and stuff. So this is really completing a suite of pieces of legislation um, that the process had already been started, but certainly we are not afraid and we're not going to run from our responsibility to the people of this country, sir. With that, sir, I am very much obliged. Honorable Member for St. Lucie. Mr. Speaker, sir, I rise to make a brief contribution to this debate as I fully support this piece of legislation brought by the Honorable Member for St. Peter. Indeed, he was very erudite in his presentation and very explanatory as to what this legislation entails. And this party has been a party that has always defended the rights of persons irrespective of who you are. As long as we knew it's your constitutional right, we have always defended. And this party has never been afraid to make decisions and take positions, perhaps where other persons have just stepped and, 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 and turned back or have been afraid to go. So I support this legislation this evening, Mr. Speaker. And discrimination has been present in our society, in various societies, for quite some time. I try today, Mr. Speaker, to fathom the argument of the leader of the opposition. And I find that in Barbadian society, at times, what we do is that we look for those wedge issues, those issues that are that, that that speak to the emotion of people generally, and we raise them for cheap political gain, or so we believe. But we have to be very truthful and forthright in what we do. I've heard of the discrim discriminatory statements, practices before by persons in high office and in leadership, I dare say, at points in time coming from this Parliament, particularly, sir, with the last administration that we had. Discrimination of which school, based on which school you went to, because people believe that you can't be anything or you are, no, you are nobody, depending on which school you went to, whether you went to, as the, the, the my grandmother would say, fifth standard, or whether you went to Harvard, <laughs> or CP or the cooperative high school and you put, that is how we judge and we look at people and these persons 
have a right they have a contribution to make far much more than some of us can even imagine I heard a statement when a former member of this chamber said of an, an, another former member that in the garrison boy can't leave me I heard a statement Mr. Speaker during the course of a eulogy of a former Prime Minister that persons that were schooled up and on were the persons who got the, the picks. I heard that. I heard that Mr. Speaker. You know? And this is some a practice. That is where we have to protect people. That is that way we have to protect the ordinary person in this country. The man out there in the street who might not be able to protect himself but who has an important contribution to make to this country. Mr. Speaker, and this legislation seeks and lets people know up front, up front, that you are protected, you have a say, you have a right. So persons now, whoever they are, will be discouraged because the legislation will be in place. Will be discouraged from discriminating. They have persons and they have if that is the business in the, in the, in the business community too. If you you know that there are persons that employ them. if you go to check whether your NIS payment is being made or not, these are things that matter to ordinary people. Whether your NIS payments are being made or not, but they're being deducted from your salary or wages. And you're not sure whether they're being paid or not. Some people have a rule awakening if they get sick or, or a young lady is pregnant. And, 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 and then when you, you, you go to and you file, you realize that your NIS payment has not been paid in to the National Insurance Department. And you know what happens? You are then discriminated and you are against by being fired or covertly. And these are things that, and I'm glad the Honorable Member for St. Peter was the one presenting this bill today because that falls under his purview as well as the on as, as, as a minister of the of the crown to check out these persons that then they dismiss people covertly because you ask a question which you have a right to do and these may look like small matters but they are important out there to the ordinary man to the gardener to the shop to 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 to, to, to the merchandiser in the shop huh to the maid, to the sales clerk. I have a case now, Mr. Speaker, which has been referred to me by a constituent because he asked about NIS payment being paid in, sent home, and some person that's rehired in his place doing the same job. There are persons, business places, Mr. Speaker, if you dare to join a trade union, they look at the person, they look for the person who is, is recruiting the, 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 the members, and they look to get rid of them, to break it up. Get rid of the steward. Or, or, or the potential shop, shop, shop steward, Mr. Speaker. These are the kind of practices that persons have had to put up with in this Barbados and this piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker, is to discourage that, those kind of practices and to let the only person know that you have cover which this administration has put in place. Mr. Speaker, and I, I, I said I won't be long and I'm not going to be long. I want to close with this. I came to political life, or I began my political journey in 2006. And Mr. Speaker, I will never forget this. I do not hold it against anybody, but I will never forget this. 
As I canvassed a particular area, Mr. Speaker, and I spoke, I introduced myself to a particular constituent potential voter. You know what I was told? But who you, where you went in? Exactly where you come from, but you ain't got nothing. We don't let the people that money got money run. Huh? The son of the porter at CP school. The son of a baker from Pike Corner. Ain't got nothing. That is what I was told, Mr. Speaker. But that did not deter me because I know I got one of the most fundamental things that is necessary and important to this particular office. That is the love and the care for people, which is important. And money don't buy that. So I came, I came to public life. I understood. I understand what it is. So how ordinary persons feel down there when they're trying to pursue their dreams and so on and what they're told, how they're being hindered and so on because I felt the same way it was that kind of stumbling block was placed in my way. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? It made me more determined than ever to succeed. So when I hear this evening, Mr. Speaker, about 2%, I am confused. I don't know whether you're talking about 2% milk, which is healthy, or I don't, I, I, I don't know. But I can only, Mr. Speaker, categorize perhaps based on the, 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 the presentation, I could only come perhaps to the conclusion that was put by my predecessor in this position in St. Lucie, it seemed that 2% is greater than 98%, Mr. Speaker. That is what it seems like to me. But this is an imaginative piece of legislation geared to protect the ordinary person out there Gear to let people know that they can pursue their dreams no matter what, no matter what happens. Because they ain't going to stop the discrimination, but what is going to happen is going to let persons who would want to discriminate understand clearly that we have placed laws, a law in place to protect people from that kind of discrimination. And with those few words, Mr. Speaker, I'm obliged to you. I don't remember Mr. Speaker, Thomas. I shall try to be brief as possible. I acknowledge what's happening on the outside, and we know that this is a very important piece of legislation, and therefore I want to say from the outset of um, my wholehearted support in respect of this legislation brought by the Honorable Member for St. Peter, who is new in the political arena, but extremely dynamic. And because he has that excellent religious and spiritual background, he has put forward these proposals this evening, sir, these aspects of the act in a way that most people will understand. And I'm not going to dwell on what the leader of the opposition said. I believe that human rights are important and people choose to go the route that they will want to with their own lives. And I'm not going to get too caught up in some of what he had said. Uh, but I would wish to say that I support this aspect of it. As a young girl in the 1950s and 60s, sir, I never saw women wear pants yet. Females did not wear pants unless they went into the cane piece with the pants of the husband or the partner on to stop the St. Peter as the cane prickles. But over time, we've seen that evolve where women wear slacks 
in the church, wherever they go, and it is an acceptable thing right now. And so as societies evolve, we didn't have women who were managers and bus drivers and police officers and so in the past either. And that strong, powerful piece of legislation that came into this country when the former member then for Christ Church West, now Sir Henry, in 1976-77, was able to come with the status of women's um, legislation and so, to bring women to the fore because women always had potential but they were suppressed. And therefore, we've seen over time, the commission on the status of women is really what the exact um, aspect of the legislation is. Now, over the years, we've seen women climb to the top and we've been supportive of men. We only had one female in parliament in the 1950s. And now we have so many females in parliament and in high offices in this country managing our schools and our numerous institutions. And therefore, things will evolve. And we cannot keep bashing or battering new things that come to the fore, but we need to think through them properly. And I know the Honorable Minister of Labor, with his team, has had extensive consultation with various other partners in the, in, in the, in the country, the social partnership, with other faith-based groups, community groups and leaders and so, to be able to bring this kind of information here to us today to bring about change in this society. We cannot always sit down and walk well, well for us for traditions of the past. We need to change as the rest of the world is changing. And therefore, what we have come here. So nothing is cast in stone. And I have a serious difficulty when people speak about sexual orientation and so, because I know of persons, because of their sexual orientation, they have been stoned. They have been shot at. They have been beaten brutally. And we know of some of those singers who have made or have sung the most ridiculous, disparaging songs to hurt human beings. We are all human beings with feelings. We are all human beings with emotions. We have certain ideals. And I want to make a really loud clarion call today for us in our schools, in our homes, communities, and villages to get right back to values education and adults and others setting examples for the youth to follow. Despite whatever we do sometimes, we cannot change the way that our children and our students and our neighbors might want to choose and make their lifestyles. After they get a certain age, we have to let them go. They have become adults. And so I want to say, sir, that I believe once we emphasize values education, and we don't only emphasize it by talking it, but we demonstrate it too, we are not going to be able to achieve those goals that we would want to have set for our children and others who are growing up in our neighborhoods and in our, in our island as a whole. We know that cultural penetration has brought us to a stage where there's so many things that we know are unacceptable and we speak out against them. But sometimes our children, because of their young minds, they can't determine the difference between right and wrong. And therefore, sometimes they are all led astray. There are some people who are born. And when you look at them as young children, you can tell that they're antics and so they may become interested in other, uh, have other preferences in life other than what we know and have grown accustomed to and what the Bible speaks about. And therefore, it is our duty to work with them. I am, however, concerned, sir, about the maltreatment that is being meted out to our disabled persons. There are many of them who have the capacity to work. It is only that disability, perhaps, or the different able persons, let me say, it is only perhaps they may have a withered hand. But many of them can use that one hand. I saw a video yesterday, sir, on my phone with a woman who has no arms at all. They're cut off to the shoulder. But she's using her foot and manipulating the steering wheel and driving like anybody else. The mechanisms are there. Why are we taking our disabled and shunting them in a corner? That was what happened in the past where people, children in the neighborhood who were disabled, they didn't do well because they, were, they had the various disabilities. And people took them to run at the shop and pick up something. Some teachers don't know how to treat them in the classroom, so they give them a book to get the time or to carry messages from classroom to classroom. Disability is not inability. 
and therefore many of our population of persons who are differently able can work their brains are bright they've got certificates but that disability is i'm happy to see that some workplaces are facilitating them and, and i think that is critical because that is the message that will be sent to other workers give these persons a chance don't judge them by their looks but judge them by their performance and their capacity to carry out the jobs just as effectively as others i know that we are coming close to home sir and that's why i'm trying to condense what i want to say i am conscious of some of the things that happen to persons in the workplace and that is why this legislation should help to empower them and to cause those leaders in departments or the leaders or the owners of the businesses to back off and give them a chance and I agree with what the honorable member for st lucy said that people are discriminated against because they want to form a union unions have always been a part of our country's history Way back from the Barbados Workers' Union, and now we have union after union representing the interests of people in the workplace. And so, as time evolves, that will happen. And I believe that the whole notion of women having to give up, give sex to get promotion, or to do things that are not in keeping with the standards in the workplace because they want to be able to keep that job, or men for that matter, is wrong and therefore this legislation should help the honorable member spoke about and yes so i'm not going to refer to that but that is a natural thing that is happening in a number of areas the money is being extracted from their wages or their salaries every time but then when they fall ill or they have to go on maternity leave or paternity leave for that matter now they are not being able to get the funding that is necessary to help them over it the other thing, Mr. Speaker, sir, is I always love to hear two Calypsonians, females to, in particular, because I believe that the larger percentage of those who are suppressed in the workplace are women or females, and there are, are young girls. And die with my dignity is one that I adore, because my mother and people of my, her era, and I still do as an older woman now, tell young people this something for something thing can't work. If you give something, or they give you something, they give you a tablet, they give you a ring, they give you a pair of earrings, something for something. That is not it to be happening, and it is happening in our, some of our workplaces as well. People are enticed by those who want to take advantage of them, particularly of their bodies, and then use them as footstools. And it's not only men who are doing it, it is both sexes that are impacting upon them. And of course, Rita Sound, our female Calypsonian, where she said, can't do that. Can't do that. And the reason why is because she had become familiar too with what would be happening in the workplace at that time, and it has become even worse now. I have a problem with pedophiles, sir. And I know the other members spoke about certain things, but we need to monitor our children with the television and the telephones and the various pieces of literature that they read because that too can help to confuse their minds and when they grow older may have some impact on them. Parents and guardians and particularly grandparents must help us raise our children in the villages, in the homes to be able to make the difference and our teachers must have impeccable character unless we have teachers who have impeccable character who are training and shaping those young minds we will not be able to achieve some of the goals that we know we have worked so hard to upgrade as a result of those young people getting older we know of it happening in too many institutions and it must it must stop i also want to as i come to a closer indicate that barbados has its standards and human rights are always at the forefront and the promotion of human rights acknowledging that everybody is somebody who needs to be treated with love respect tolerance whatever else has to come his or her way and i know that this barbados labor party having been able to pilot so many different aspects of legislation across this country for all the years that we years that we have been a government or for all the years that we have been uh, uh, in opposition we have stuck to the rigid principles to make sure 
that whatever we do or whatever is projected is above board and helping to enhance and upgrade our moral standards and our values. And therefore, I believe that a matter of this nature, when it comes to the 2% that the armed member for uh, the leader of the opposition is speaking about, whenever that time comes, we will treat to it as a, a matter where the people's assemblies and other public fora will treat a matter of the same same sex and the different things on sexual orientation and so that is being discussed here. We are, it is not beyond us as a people to continue to have that community dialogue to make sure that at the end of the day, we are all singing from the same hymn page and that, and that, and that whatever the outcome is, we have given people a chance to contribute towards whatever the outcome will be. There will be no hard and fast effort to push anything any, down anybody's throat. We are going to have the community dialogue. We're going to work with the agencies, the community-based organizations, the community groups, and as I said just now, with the People's Assembly's gatherings to be able for people to come, vent their feelings, thrash out the ideas in order for us to collate the information that is necessary and go forward to be able to make a change in this country. And so I close by saying I am proud to be a part of this institution today we have seen the forward thinking and the planning, the negotiations, the, the dialogue, the discussion, the tripartite approach and so on to be able to bring all of the stakeholders on board to say to the people of Barbados, we are coming with this particular bill, employment rights bill, to be able to make sure that at the end of the day we can all work with it and where it needs to be tweeted, we will tweet it to be able to make sure that we continue to uphold and point towards those values and the systems that are necessary that we as a proud independent nation can tell the rest of the world we can do it and we can do it with pride and ensuring that we embrace all and sundry in the exercise because at the end of the day we have to live here and every human must have the dignity that is necessary to be able to continue to make his or her contribution to the growth and the development of this country. Mr. Speaker, with those comments, I would wish to make my final comment. Thank you, sir. You please, armor, can you please turn off your mic? Armor of St. Peter. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank those who contributed to the debate on what I consider to be a very important matter this evening. I start my wrap up by saying to you, Mr. Speaker, that I am above and beyond everything a Christian. Now, I don't say that to have to reinforce anything, but I'm saying it to give a little bit of context to what I will say next. In Matthew 5, there is a passage where the entire chapter, Beatitudes, Similitudes, number of things, light, salt, etc. There are a number of things in Matthew 5. <clears throat> that I want to commend to Christians all across Barbados and across the world. Matthew 5, that fifth chapter, ends with an encouragement for people to become perfect like God is perfect. The few verses before that final verse says something that too many of us do not want to accept. The verses, Mr. Speaker, talk about God allowing the sun to shine on the just and the unjust and the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. I started by saying I'm a Christian and it is because Maybe unlike some of my colleagues, I believe in right and wrong. So there are some things that I believe are right, and there are some things that I believe are wrong. 
But I take my cue from scripture. And therefore, while I hold certain views on actions or even thoughts, because when Jesus came, when he talked about murder, he said, there are some people who are guilty of it, but haven't stabbed or shot anybody yet. But I don't know if they didn't have guns probably at that point. <laughs> but bows and arrows and those other kind of things. But you can do it in your mind. I believe, calling Jordan from Rosal, that there is right and there is wrong. But like I said, I take my cue from God and, the, and Scripture, and Scripture is God, that I believe in. Whether a person is right or wrong, God is saying to me, they have to be treated fairly. There was one point when the disciples asked him, and this was a, a matter of, well, let, let me use the one with the tears and the wheat. Jesus said, let them grow together. Because if you're going to pull out those tears, you may pull up some wheat along with those tears. Leave that situation until the harvest. Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear that acknowledging a reality is not condoning a practice. It, 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 it never has been. It, it just never has been. I, I tell my children all the time, when it gets a certain time of day, evening, close the windows. Because somebody may come in. I, I'm not condoning theft by acknowledging that they are crooks. I have worked in business law enough, and I know a ton of them. I've had a fair few. Acknowledging something is not the same as condoning the thing. Now, let me also say though, Mr. Speaker, that as a person of faith, I do not use, and I do not believe my God wants me to, use the legislature of a country to enforce my beliefs on the people of the country. You know when I push my beliefs and try to encourage people, every Sabbath we do a Zoom, we do Zoom church, where we're going back to church on Sabbath coming. But I, I encourage the honorable member for St. Michael South Central Sport to my, my affinity to, for stewardship. And that's what I've talked about for most of the shut down, most of the period when we're not in church. I will not, I believe in tithing. I don't come to Parliament. I, I have a lot of Christian brothers and sisters who don't believe in tithing. I, I don't come to Parliament or go to Cabinet to try to say there should be tithing. Those are matters that are encouraged by people like me in a particular area of activity. That is to say, when I am in a, a crusade of evangelistic activity, that is when I do that. But I do not come, and I can share those views here as well, but a parliament is not a place to enforce through legislation my own views. It is not the place. Now, I just thought that I needed to say that because I feel very strongly about faith. And because I feel strongly about faith, I have not, I grew up hearing people get upset when people of faith speak about things that are blatantly not right. And some people use those opportunities to leave the church. I've never been like that. I always knew that my relationship with God had to be a personal relationship. It could not be based on what other people were telling me, even though it could be influenced by that. And so that is why, from time to time, I try not to overquote in this honorable chamber, but from time to time, you will hear me refer to the basis on which I take my guidance. To be perfect, 
God expect me, expects me not to discriminate. I follow his example. He is said to me, I don't. He, like me, well, let me put it a different way. I, like him, acknowledge that there is good and bad. I believe that there is just and unjust. So I, I, I know that some people don't like to judge. I reserve the right. That is my view. I reserve the right. But I also know that having come to a conclusion in my mind as to what is right or wrong, I cannot say to the person who I think is wrong, you cannot enjoy the benefits that I enjoy in this society. It simply is not right. It is not Christian. A couple of things I just want to speak to. Have persons been discriminated in employment in Barbados due to sexual orientation? The answer to that question is yes. Straight up, the answer is yes. If you have reason to speak to persons in some of the civil society organizations that have been set up to address matters related to persons of set of a sexual orientation different from mine they will tell you and they have told me they have suffered that before you know i i also want to, to say something I, I surprised a muslim friend of mine when i said to him that i belong to a denomination who believes or that believes in religious liberty I feel strongly, and all my colleagues know this, about Sabbath observance. But a Seventh Adventist attorney from our headquarters in Michigan attended court a few years ago, and I sent the article to my, my friend, attended court to represent, as a friend of the court, Amicus Curiae, Curiae. I think that's what they call Curiae. Amicus Curiae. Amicus Curiae to represent a Muslim man who was having problems getting in his employment, being able to observe prayers on a Friday. For Muslims, Friday is the day. For some Adventists, Saturday Sabbath is the day. But we recognize that everybody has the right to make their own choice. Now, if I'm a crusade, I would be preaching all over Pinelands, all over, anywhere, encouraging people to observe Sabbath. But if a person is observing Friday, that person has a right to be able to observe it according to the dictates of their character. That is just how human beings operate. And that is how my denomination, not everybody in my denomination, understands those things, but I try to do a little bit of teaching whenever I can. So, persons have been discriminated against. I have been loath to speak to this matter in public. And it is because as a Christian, I am really speaking to other Christians. The word is hypocrisy. One day, while I was president of the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association, a reporter came to me to ask me if I was opposed, knowing my faith background, if I was opposed to gambling. The discussion at the time was casino gambling. I asked the gentleman, are you referring to one-armed bandits? No. <laughs> the interview stopped. Because he recognized the inconsistency, the hypocrisy. I said to him, though, even though he kind of backed off, I said to him, I am opposed to gambling. I'm not opposed to casino gambling. I am opposed to gambling. Because I believe that a person should have principles. 
So I am not dis I, I, I'm not differentiating between one or the other. Now a country can decide to do it, but my personal view is that I'm opposed to Gambia. That's what he told the gentleman. That conversation was an illustration of the kind of hypocrisy that sometimes exists in our society. Where persons would be talking about, I think I heard the Honorable Attorney General talk about it, mafia and this thing, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of evil. Now you don't believe in big sin and small sin. The bandit, the scratch card, the casino, for me, same thing. I have a similar view to anything that, I, that for me is outside of marriage between a man and a woman. But I do not understand a society that accepts or that appears to accept a man and a woman who are not married living together but cannot accept anything other than that. Is one, if that is your perspective, is one worse than the other? Is one worse than the other? I, I do not understand principles that are not straight, that kind of wavy wavy. I think it is hypocritical. In any case though, Mr. Speaker, whether or not a person agrees, we live in a country where there can be no discrimination. A person cannot be subject to a detriment because they do something that I do not believe is the correct thing. I, I could not be a part of a legislature. Well, I could not be part of a government pushing an agenda that seeks to discriminate discriminate against anybody just because I don't agree with them. I, I can't do it. It is unprincipled for me. I did not come to office to try to well I came to office and the route to come into office is getting votes. But the people of St. Peter know that I will not just talk and say sweet stuff to get votes. I stand for principle. People know my family. We've always stood for principle. And I am not going to be part of a hypocritical approach to the matter of governing and how we interface with people in this country. I, I just can't do it. The matter of whether or not sexual orientation should be actually stated. I've thought about that, you know, over the past, since the Honorable Member of St. Michael West mentioned it. And I wonder what would be the purpose of a bill that seeks to prevent discrimination in employment if those possible areas of discrimination are not listed, are not mentioned. How, how do you do that? I, I confess that I'm not an attorney. And these, th this kind of thinking now makes me sorry that I did not do what the Honorable Member for St. Michael Southeast and the Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast and St. Joseph, all those learned, uh, my neighbor from St. James North. I'm not learning the law. But if I want to prohibit something, then I have to be clear about what I want to prohibit. I want to prohibit 18 plus 1 areas, possible areas of discrimination. We identify, and Mr. Speaker, the matter of subtle, <laughs> I wrote this down and I can't believe it, but I wrote it nonetheless. Subtle, behind the back, and subversive. Three terms I heard used today. I thought, I don't know, I don't know a nice way of putting it, but you know I really thought it was very, no, this is probably a nice way, really unfortunate. I stood up in this honorable chamber because 
I St. Peter People's Strong. I stood in this honorable chamber, identified very clearly those areas that I believe would be the subject of further conversation. Never hid from them, never tried to gloss over any of them. But we hear things like subtle, behind the back, subversive. I suspect that some of those terms are used to add an element of emotion to evoke a response from people, but I believe that decision making should be primarily in the frontal lobe. I understand that there are emotional impacts to decision making, but I believe that the gray matter here is really where decisions should be made. So. I just think it is unfortunate that these kinds of terms were used. And um, I, I want to assure the people of the country, though, because it is hard to speak for five or six people under the breadfruit leaf. But I want to say to Barbadians generally that this government has no intention of sleight of hand, no intention of being subtle, behind the back, or subversive. Everything that we have done has been above board and very, very clear. We spoke to, we had two bills here on cannabis. One was medical, one was sacramental. Debates that lasted almost the entire day. On Parliament's website, live on 100.7 FM, because whatever we're going to do, it is going to be in front of the people. We are not subtle. We are not subversive. So just, I just want to make that very, very clear. The, there is another matter that I have given some thought to and actually spoke about it in my own church. The matter of recognizing that something is right but because it may appear to be the top of a slippery slope, we don't do it. Again, Mr. Speaker, you may not, but others may fault me for this. I have to go back to scripture. And the Bible is very clear. I believe that the Ten Commandments are binding, but you know, Scripture also says, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And I'm going to leave that right there. There was a question asked about the, and it was the Honorable Member for St. James North. I think he, he identified a matter that we have started to speak to, but have not really fully exhausted it within the ministry. And that has to do with the capacity of the Employment Rights Tribunal as we move forward, because we have this bill, which is now adding to the pieces of labor legislation that are the subject of supervision by the Employment Rights Tribunal. Um, we are working and we are coming to cabinet very soon, actually maybe this Thursday, I hope, with a paternity leave bill. And when we talk about not discriminating, this we didn't put this in the in this bill that we have, but we are committed to bringing to Parliament legislation that will allow for paternity leave. And we first will get the approval of the cabinet on that matter. But the intention of the government as set out in its manifesto is that we would have paternity leave legislation. What that looks like will be the subject of discussion at the level of the cabinet. The cabinet will consider what my ministry and I have are proposing and we will be coming to parliament on that matter. 
But all, all that said, the employment rights tribunals have been looked at critically. We have to assess function, resources, volume of work, and make some serious decisions as to how we move forward where those are concerned. So, Mr. Speaker, addressing those matters, I think that we have heard full discussion, full input from many members of this honorable chamber on the matter of discrimination generally, but particularly this bill speaks to discrimination related to employment. I want to end where I started. A job, the ability to earn money, the ability to be able to sustain one's self is critical to the humanity of people. People feel or become fulfilled when they're able to contribute. But there is reward for that contribution. People earn and people use those funds to support themselves, including to buy food and to be able to live a decent life. This Barbados Labour Party and this minister will not subscribe to any view that will hinder any person in this country from being able to earn a living and support themselves, feed themselves and their families and be able to live a decent life in this country. Regardless, even people in prison are allowed to earn small money and get food. People who have murdered, we are not going to allow anybody in this country not to have the opportunity to be able to gain employment and support themselves. And so, Mr. Speaker, with that philosophy in mind, I want to ask that this bill be read a second time. Questions that the aforementioned bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. Meeting the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I beg to ask that you do now leave the chair and that the House resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. The question is that the Speaker do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. Meeting the ayes okay. This house is now in committee. Part one, clauses one and two. Madam Chair, I beg that part one, clauses one and two, stand by. I'm relieved the opposition. Uh, Chair, I would like humbly to request of the house that we separate the request for vote on part one, clauses one and two, and call the clauses separately. I want to reiterate I have serious concerns about the definitions of domestic partnership, domestic partner, domestic partnership status, and family member under Clause 2, and I want to vote against Clause 2. I do not want to vote against anything else in the bill except Clause 2. I ask that we call before a separate vote on the two clauses. Clause 1. The question is that Clause 1 stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. Aye. All honorable members against, please say nay. We think the ayes have it. Clause 2. The question is that Clause 2 stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. Aye. All honorable members against, please say nay. We think the ayes have it. 
Safa Vó? Hmm? Safa Vó? Well, you can call for... Uh, you can call for different anything. Sorry? Sorry? Call any time, there you go. Well, Ms. Bradshaw? Aye. Mr. Marshall? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Simmons? Aye. Mrs. Husbands? Aye. Mr. Rowe? Aye. Dr. Dugid? Aye. Mr. Goodenagel? Aye. Mr. Thorne? Yes. Lieutenant Colonel Bostick? Reverend Athley? No. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Mr. Weir? Aye. Mr. Griffith? Aye. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Sutherland? Aye. Mr. Hinkson? Aye. Madam Chair? 18 honorable members vote in favor of the clause and one I'm gonna remember what it against. So methinks the eyes have it on clause two. Clause three. The question is that clause three stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All honorable members against, please say nay. May thinks the eyes have it. Clause four. Second. Second, please. Qu you question is that clause four stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All honorable members against, please say nay. May thinks the eyes have it. Clause five. 
Question is that Clause 5 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All honourable members against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 6. Question is that Clause 6 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 7. Clause huh? eight. No, hold on. We did seven. Question seven. is, <laughs> if um, honourable members in favour for clause seven, say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Clause eight. <coughs> Question is that clause eight stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Clause 9. Question is that Clause 9 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 10. Question is that Clause 10 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 11. Question is that clause 11 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All honourable members against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 12. <laughs> Question is that clause 12 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 13. Question is that Clause 13 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All honourable members against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 14. <laughs> Question is that Clause 14 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 15. <laughs> Question is that Clause. 15. 15 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 6. Question is that clause 16 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 17. Question is that Clause 17 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. All honourable members against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 18. Question is that Clause 18 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 19. Question is that clause 19 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 20. Question is that clause 20 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 21. Question is that clause 21 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. You think the ayes have it. Clause 22. Mm. Question is that clause 22 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. You think the ayes have it. Clause 23. Question is that clause 23 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 24. Question is that clause 24 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. All honourable members against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 25. Question is that clause 25 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All honourable members against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 26. 
question is that clause 26 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 27. Question is that clause 27 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 28. Question is that clause 28 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All honourable members against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 29. Question is that clause 29 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 30. Question is that clause 30 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 31. Question is that clause 31 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 32. Question is that clause 32 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 33. Question is that clause 33 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 34. Question is that clause 34 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. Aye, aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 35. Question is that clause 35 stand par. All honourable members in favour, <laughs> please say aye. Aye, aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. Clause 36. Question is that clause 36 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All honourable members against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Clause 37. Question is that clause 37 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have clause it. Clause 38. Of course. Question is that clause 38 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 39. Question is that clause 39 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 40. Question is that clause 40 stand par. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. First schedule. Question is that the first schedule be the first schedule to the bill. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Second schedule. Question is that the second schedule be the second schedule to the bill. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Report. Second. Question is that I do now report to his honor the speaker the passing of one bill in committee. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. The chairman of committees has reported the passing of one bill in committee. I remember some beta.
The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a third time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. Me think the ayes have it. The question is that the aforementioned bill be passed and so cited. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. Me think the ayes have it. This bill is passed and so cited. The speaker, we committal of government notices. Army leader, government business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to give notice of a resolution to extend the public health emergency. To government business. Mr. Speaker, with that, we have come to the end of today's sitting. It has indeed been a long day, um, but an eventful one nonetheless. Um, I beg to move that the House be adjourned until August 4th at 10 a.m. Question that this honorable chamber be adjourned until the fourth day of August at 10 a.m. in the forenoon. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. This honorable chamber stands adjourned until Tuesday, the fourth day of August at 10 a.m. in the forenoon.